Hey, Mike, the expectations for LSU baseball, some of the highest in the country. And there's a reminder back home in Alex Box, in case they ever forget, it's called the Omaha Room. Trophies, pictures, mementos of all their trips here, along with their six national championships. But there's been a drought since 2009. This team hoping to bring some hardware back to that Omaha Room. I mean, it's an honor to bring LSU baseball back to the pinnacle of college baseball. We have an Omaha room, and you just want to add your little memento. I get chills thinking about it. I saw the trophy downstairs for the first time during that press conference, and I just wanted to, like, grab it. That's what we worked every single day since August 4th. Greatest accomplishment of my life, for sure. You know, being able to hold that trophy over my head with the best group of guys that I could ask for behind me, it mean the world to me. We've all been dreaming about this. I mean, this is the first talk of the year was talking about coming to Omaha and winning the thing and stuff. But now that we're actually here, it's just so surreal for all of us. This is a roster that's from all over, but there are a bunch of Louisiana natives on this team, Kay Beloso being one of them. And when you talk about what this would mean to the state, to the fan base, it gets a little emotional when he thinks and envisions holding up that trophy today. Yeah, Jay Johnson in year two trying to get them there. And in game two today, he throws the junior lefty Nate Ackenhausen, an Oklahoma native, making just his second start of the season, and they've both been here in Omaha. Yeah, it's pretty crazy when you think a week ago when we were talking about Nate, Nate Ackenhausen going to be an important part out of the bullpen. Well, he wasn't. He was an important part in a game to keep LSU's season going along in that one against Tennessee. Six innings, four hits, didn't walk anybody, punched out seven. And the off-speed stuff was outstanding. He faces this Florida batting order brought to you by Capital One and Berkey. The stars need to be stars for the Gators. Yeah, 152. It's alarming that they're at this point with those numbers. Something tells me those two have a big one in them today. First pitch is cut out and missed by Cade Curland at 91. And away we go with game two in this best of three. Florida hitters struck out 20 times and only walked twice in the 11 innings against the LSU arms yesterday headlined by Ty Floyd Kevin O'Sullivan the Florida head coach said afterward it's really the first time that maybe our swings got big with the moment and the stage here fouled away one and two on Curry well, I think the other side of that is Ty Floyd was special yeah and, and we know the fastball was special last night it had even another gear to it and he landed a slider and a changeup like it, it you know yeah, could Florida have done better? Sure, but Ty Floyd was he was really good. All time great. 17 strikeouts across oh. eight innings tied for the second most strikeouts in a game in men's college World Series history. And so with Paul Skeens unavailable for a second straight game Ackenhausen on the ball oh. and it's a full count on Cade Curlin. Skeens with the mustache in postseason form. Payoff to Curlin. His bounce left side. And Jordan Thompson who bumps into Tommy White. Not in time. Kate Curlin is on to start things. Well, I, I thought Curlin actually did Ackenhausen a favor there because he swung at ball four. But Tommy White and Jordan Thompson, you want White to go get it. Like, just go run through that ball. He pulls up late, and at that point, they're going to run into each other, right? That's really Tommy White's ball. You want the third baseman to own that one. Of course, Jordan Thompson has to be in position in case White can't get there, but felt like White should have taken one more step and made that play running towards first base. So the leadoff man on in front of Wyatt Langford, junior center fielder and Florida star. Projected top three overall draft pick according to our Kylie McDaniel. Last nine games though for Wyatt Langford. Just five for 36. Yesterday one for five had a double in the third and then in the tenth smoked that line out to left. Well, the outs are loud. Yeah there's been tons of hard contact in that five for 36. He was hitting 399 before that five for 36. I mean he's had an incredible season but it doesn't feel very far off and at a 2 0 count with the wind blowing out watch out right here. Ackenhausen will check out Curlin. How much of an impact should we make on the wind. It's huge. Uh, yeah I think it is too and I, I think that you know Waldrop's a guy that doesn't give up quite as many fly balls. 
Akinazen can sometimes, and, and this ballpark is going to play different than it has all well, the last 10 days. Huh. That's a strike at 93, 2 and 1. However, if you punch out 20 times, doesn't make that big of a difference. <laughs> I mean, you still. You still got to give yourself a chance, and that's the biggest thing that Florida needs to do. 36 combined strikeouts yesterday between these two teams. Oh. Three and one on Langford. Eichenhausen did not walk a soul in his last outing. He he threw ball four to Curlin, who, who swung at ball four. Now three ball count here to Langford. It, it certainly doesn't look as comfortable as it did in his first start against Tennessee. Yeah, Ackenhausen was pitching there Tuesday against Tennessee, the first of LSU's three straight elimination games, and went a season high six innings. A shutout ball with seven strikeouts, also a season high. And Gavin Dugas said afterward, he saved our season. 3 1. Cut out and miss with a fastball. Interesting. Took a 2 0 heater, looked tardy there on a 3 1 heater. Maybe just swinging a little too hard here in Omaha for Ryan Langford. 3 2. Ball four. It's ball four. Good take by Wyatt Langford, and the first two are on for Florida here in the first. And that was awfully close right there. Exactly where he was trying to go with that fastball. Langford sold it pretty well. And Jeff Head was buying it. And boy, this is an LSU staff that didn't pitch with much traffic yesterday. And they got their hands full here right out of the gate. For Jack Caglione, who was one of those three Golden Spikes Award finalists. He's got 31 home runs. Nobody in the country has more. He's tied for first, of course, with Wake Forest star Brock Wilkin. Like we showed you off the top, like Wyatt Langford, Jack Caglione trying to get rolling. A one. Oh. This is outside. And I would say, unlike Wyatt Langford, the outs have not been loud. Right? He's got he's got two hits, one a single, and then the other one a pop up double that was probably a pretty friendly scoring. He has not been real competitive with his at bats to this point. 1 1 pitch on the ground sharply to train Morgan who gobbles and gets the first down. I'm surprised that Morgan didn't go to second on that because that was hit hard enough and especially with the left hander there's you would think plenty of time to get the lead runner 108 off the bat for Kags and, and Berkey hit this one hard just hit it right out. Yeah he's got a great angle to throw that ball to Trey Morgan didn't even think about it. And they wouldn't have turned to them, no. but it'd be nice to have one less runner in scoring position. A missile off the bat of Caglione, who just hasn't been able to get the ball elevated here. So it brings up the All American shortstop, Josh Rivera. Oh. And he takes ball one to start. Florida now three for 33 with runners in scoring position here at the College World Series. Rivera's got three home runs his last six games. Oh. Takes down 2-0. Oh. You know, it was a very loose Florida dugout. You guys were down there with me. Like, this dugout, very confident, very loose. And this is a dream scenario here to start. Second and third with one of their best run producers up and a hitter's count. 2-0. Oh. Pearls to the bottom of the zone for a called strike. Well, obviously, always an advantage to get in ahead. I mean, that, that's mm -hmm. pretty simple math. But in this one, when LSU already has a one nothing lead, if you get ahead, they're going to use their bullpen totally different than if if they're if they are ahead. Two one. Huh. That's a strike. Two and two. Couple good breaking balls there. Don't know if that one got all the way back, but Jeff Head thought it did, and I would. Wouldn't be surprised if they stick with that breaking ball here with first base open. Back in house since 2 2. It's a fastball cut on and missed. Two go. No, it's interesting because Ackenhausen against right handers this year, the swing and miss percentage on the slider and the changeup both above 50%. On the fastball, significantly less, but still went back to it right there with Rivera. That had. Maybe just enough arm side run to get it off the bat, but a giant strikeout right there for Nate Ackenhausen, his first of the day. 
Uh, he's a guy who's got reverse splits, so he's actually been far tougher on righties. And lefties like BT Ryapel have seen him better. Fifth year senior catcher in the five spot. Oh, yeah. Takes ball one. What a missed chance, right? You, you had 2 0 count with a runner on third base, and Rivera comes up empty. Love to see Ryapel cash it in right here. Ryapel with six hits in the tournament, and five of them are home runs. Oh. Outside 2 0. Yesterday, a solo shot in the sixth to the pull side for BT Ryapel. 2 0. Fouled back. Five homers and a double. That's been his postseason. Plays. Just, he'd love a little roller here in the four hole. <laughs> Just like, he's probably thinking, bad, you know, three run homer wouldn't be bad either, but a pretty remarkable run of power production from the Gator captain here in this postseason. He's got a two and one count against Nate Ackethouse in here in the first. The pitch. That's down and away, three and one. Ackenhaus in already up at 24 pitches. More balls and strikes, and that was not that was not the the approach just a week ago. 3-1. Up the ladder and pop foul. And a full count again. That was ball four. We've seen that twice. And Curlin did it to start and he reached, but right there, Ryapel did it 3 1. Now he's got to go back to work. Luke Heyman would be next. The LSU fans activate in the first. The 3 2. Strike three calls. Nate Atkinhausen leaves two in the first. Had to clean up a little mess right here, but this is a pretty good way to do it. Left on left slider freezes BT Ryapel, a scoreless first. The Tigers coming up next. Florida comes up empty after a big opportunity in the top of the first, and now Jay Johnson's Tigers bat for the first time, and let's get you their batting order. Brought to you by Capital One, headlined by the newly minted Golden Spikes Award winner Dylan Cruz. Congratulations to Dylan Cruz, one of the best college careers you, you can draw up and punctuated by the Golden Spikes Award and he's hoping it's really punctuated by a national championship here this afternoon. Chris Bunn was with his folks George and Kim right before the game and now LSU faces Hurston Waldrop third in the country in strikeouts. Yeah, Dylan and the Tigers have their hands full today though because they're facing a really good one. We talked about Waldrop in that split. It's a mid 90s fastball and it could be more than that. I mean, he could show you 97s 98s. The split is the difference maker. You just can't get to two strikes because when it gets to two strikes that's when he uses it even more. He can land the split but when he gets to two strikes it's generally when he's going to get swing and miss out of the zone. Kylie McDaniel said yesterday on baseball tonight it now looks like Hurston Waldrop will not get past pick number 20. Jeff Passan said he's heard him mentioned in the top 10. Last three weeks haven't hurt. <laughs> and he started throwing that thing more. We said it on the open 21 innings in the postseason. He struck out 37. And he's using the split more than he did during the regular season. It was one of the big storylines coming into this finals that Florida had its starting pitching aligned optimally whereas LSU did not. First pitch from Waldrop is 98 down low to Dylan Cruz. <laughs> On the ground sharply past the dive of Colby Halter and Dylan Cruz has a leadoff single in the home half of the first. That's what he's done all year long. An on base machine has now reached base in every game this season. Leads the country in runs. And when he gets on, it works out pretty well for this Tiger line. He is number one on uh, Kylie's MLB draft rankings. And that's in front of this guy, Tommy White, who's up to 101 RBIs, now second most in the country. Had the solo home run in the eighth inning oh. yesterday. That tied the game 3 3. And that was a look at the split change from Hurston Waldrop. <laughs> you, 
can have the greatest plan in the world. But when you get up there and you see that thing, uh, there, there's just not too many that are like that at any level. 1-1. One, one. Fastball fouled away at 99. Well, it's interesting with Waldron. I mean, he's been up to 99 already. The slugging percentage against the fastball this year, excuse me, the OPS is above 1,000. Mm. Guys hit that pitch well. Against the split, it's 222. Well, yeah. oh, it just misses. That was the split change there. Wow. Waldron had to shake that one off. That That's... Tough call for the Gators right there. It's a pitch that generates whips like that on two thirds of the swings, and it's the first K for Hurst and Waldrop, and there's one gone in the first. You talk about it. Well, I mean, you said it. Don't get to two strikes, right? And, and you look. There's the grip, and it's it's a low spin pitch. Like he will he will spin that thing under a thousand RPMs, which you know a normal breaking ball is somewhere in 2500s. This is an off speed pitch that is just. A gravity ball that that almost wobbles on its way to the play and just gives hitters fits because the trajectory out of the hand is actually flat and the ball just doesn't arrive. Oh. Starts with ball one to Trey Morgan, the junior first baseman. Excellent defensively, and he's had a great postseason for the Tigers. Well, oh. that misses on a splitter. I mean, to put it in context, we showed you the numbers. 65% whiff rate. That is absurd, and it's the second highest whiff rate in the Vinny entire pitch. sport. Yes. Well, that misses, and it's 3 0 on Trey Morgan. Waldrop's 3 0. That's a strike and 97. And it's three and one. First and Waldrop trying to feel out the strike zone. I don't know that anybody's felt it out quite yet. Jeff Head is, is one of the best that we have in a collegiate game, and it's been a little inconsistent so far. Morgan chops it up the middle. And Josh Rivera. Two down. I like that though, sending Dylan Cruz. There, there's a hitter up to bat with tremendous bat to ball and a guy on the mound is going to induce a bunch of grounders and put him in motion and now you got a run scoring opportunity here for Gavin Dugas. Who's the fifth year senior from Homa Louisiana. And wears that coveted number eight jersey for a second straight season. Best exemplifies the spirit Whoa. of the program with leadership and dedication to one of the upperclassmen. He's got it two years in a row. Yeah, it just shows you the kind of kid he is, the kind of leader he is. <laughs> and on a team where Dylan Cruz is the Golden Spikes Award winner and Mr. Everything, Gavin Dugas is the one that wears number eight. He bats with Cruz at second and two outs. Oh. Two and one. Looked like the takes that we saw last night for Dugas. Spitting on a changeup just down and out right there, spitting on two pretty good splits already in this at bat. Goes the opposite way toward the gap in right center and splits it all the way to the wall. Gavin Dugas puts the Tigers on top here in game two. How locked in is this guy? Oh. They got him out with a bunch of sliders last night, and after spitting on a couple of splits, he earns himself a slider. Here you see a slider just sitting there. But I love how he keeps his chest over the plate. Just does a beautiful job of staying on and through that baseball and 106 miles an hour in the right center field gap. And that's why he wears number eight. Boy, does he have a knack for the big hit. He's got a homer and now two doubles and four hits total in these two games in the finals. And now ball one, the K to Beloso, the fifth year senior DH from New Orleans. He's had his best season with the bat. Three hits yesterday, including that home run in the 11th that put LSU up 4 3. We could hear him in the dugout saying after his home run that he couldn't breathe amid all the excitement. 2 0. That's down, and it's 3 0 from Hurston Waldron. They're not even messing with him. Uh -uh. 
Well, you want to swing, go ahead. But first base open now, three and zero to Beloso, who's already hit two in the seats in this series. Ball four inside and a four pitch walk. To a board with two outs for Hayden Travinsky. Hayden Travinsky is the redshirt junior from Shreveport, Louisiana, who raked down the stretch. But it's his first start since Monday now. He did start the first two games here in Omaha and has been dealing with an injury to his rib cage. Came off the bench in game one yesterday and gets a start here today. Yeah, and hit a hit a pretty deep fly ball out to center field and, and showed no ill effects of whatever he's dealing with. And so on a day where the conditions seem to be very offensive, it it makes sense. If he's feeling anywhere close to 100 percent, you got to have a bat with this kind of thunder in your lineup. T. Ryapel with visit number one to the mound for Hurston Waldrop. Who has not thrown a first pitch strike to the six batters he's faced now here in this first. 1 0. Kravinsky couldn't hold up. The one one. That's a strike one and two. If he lands it like he does back to back right there, then he flips the count and it gets totally different. LSU can't just sit and watch it there. This is the first time today that he's been able to do that. You talked earlier about the fastball, but there's been so much more off speed during this stretch from Hurston Walter. And the numbers have been significantly better. I mean, he he, he went into the postseason with an ERA. I mean, look at the stuff. The ERA that was not too far away from five. It's done nothing but drop since then, but a lot of that is due to the increased usage of the split. He's only thrown about 41% fastballs this postseason. 2-2. Two -two. Oh. That's high and a full count on Travinsky. Braden Joe Bear would be next. 3-2. Ball four. Misses. And they are loaded for LSU. Brandon Sprout, the starter in game one for Florida, really had the work. Ended up throwing 111 pitches across four innings. And now 26 in counting for Hurston Waldrop in the first in game two. And it's a Gator bullpen that was taxed heavily last night. Well, here is the redshirt junior, Braden Joe Bear. Oh. Takes ball one. Joe Bear, three strikeouts yesterday. He also faced Hurston Waldrop last year, punched out three times, all on splitters. Oh. That's a slider that misses. And now the second visit used by Florida here in the first. Well, you know, it's one thing to pitch around your fastball when you got command of everything else. When you don't, at some point you're going to have to throw the heater. Yeah, I mean, you, you got to throw whatever you can throw to throw strikes. Mm -hmm. And and right now the split is not there. I mean, it's it's darn near two to one balls to strikes right now. But I, I think this visit is a reminder to say, hey, you're one pitch away from getting in the dugout, and that's a one not the game. We're going to score runs today. At least you would think they are, given the way that this setting is. Now it's just reset the mind to where, okay, we got some traffic and you worked a little bit harder than you want. You still want away from getting us back in there. And can Waldrop limit it the way Brandon Sproat did, especially early right. in the game mm -hmm. yesterday? Yeah, I mean, the first four innings, LSU left 10 on yesterday. And 17 total. On the ground, right side at Cade Curlin. Caglione to the bag, inning over. LSU strikes first and leaves him loaded, and in game two in Omaha, the Tigers have the lead.
Welcome back to Omaha. Tigers up 1-0. You know, Luke Heyman grew up in Longwood, Florida. You would think maybe he would be a Gator fan. Uh, he did not. He grew up an FSU fan. Don't tell anybody. Mom went there. Grandparents went there. Grew up going to sporting events. Eventually just fell in love with the Florida baseball program. It was tough for mom, though, because she had to start wearing blue and orange, and she would refuse to buy anything that had the Gator logo. So she'd go to Etsy and she'd get, you know, made with Florida and, you know, didn't want to put the gator on it. Now she's fully <laughs> accepted it. Berkey's a big Etsy guy. Oh, yeah. yeah he he kind of designs his own clothes. It's a good touch. That's oh. what I've heard. Yeah. Etsy, huh? Okay. Not a lot of time spent there. Uh, Button has spoiled the secret to all of America as the freshman Luke Heyman climbs in against Nate Ackenhaus in here in the second. Boy, an eventful yeah. edge of your seat first inning, boy. One run. For all of that, one yeah. run. A combined 55 pitch first inning. One two from Ackenhausen. Oh. Up and away. We don't just have high drama games here in Omaha. It's innings. Yes. Okay. It's, <laughs> we're on the edge of our seat on an inning by inning basis. Two two. Up the ladder. Three K's in a row for Nate Ackenhausen. Well, that was the story last night was up the ladder. And Florida could not hold off of Ty Floyd's fastball up in the zone. Ackenhausen doesn't do it quite as much. But that time did the same thing as we saw last night. Grab the four seamer, just throw right through those seams. Back to back to back strikeouts for Ackenhausen. Who now faces Tyler Shelna. Seven spot oh. left fielder takes a breaking ball for strike one. Ackenhausen mixed in the off-speed Tuesday. In particular, the changeup. He said after his start in that one was really working for him. It averages 84, 85. That was 86. That was it. Yeah, that was it. He's got really good down to it too. Uh, both of his breaking or his breaking ball and his changeup are his two best pitches. Shall not strikes out. Off-speed and it's four punch outs in a row. Okay, so so what is it? Because I mean it's it's good. Don't get me wrong, but. Right hander swing and misses that pitch over 50% of the time. They, there's something about it, whether it's deception, the spin, I don't know what it is, but it, that's that's what happens when he throws it. Yeah, you could. Shelnut certainly didn't see the spin there because that was a middle, middle yes. breaking ball. And now a change up to start to Ty Evans, right fielder in the eighth spot. He's got four hits here in Omaha, and they are all extra base hits. That one foul. No, they say that's yeah. fair. Evans didn't even leave home plate, and that ball is gone. Well, we told you there would be offense with the wind blowing, and Ty Evans down the line, and this game is tied. Why he's in there, Berkey? Yeah. Um, Ty Evans is leading the College World Series in home runs. And, and he didn't start game one. <laughs> I don't know that anybody had that on their bingo card, a four-seamer down and in, and that is what you call dropping the head on one, and he's just not sure. Is that one going to stay straight? This is where the wind blowing out helps it, right, because the ball does yeah. not curve as much side to side. And you can see where this one lands relative to the fans up there in that, in that walkway. That is... Oh. A fair ball, and the Gators are all tied up. That I'm is fine. a bolt for Ty Evans, the sophomore from Auburndale, Florida, who originally last Friday in the first game here for the Gators came on late as a pinch hitter. Oh. And what a burst he has been for Florida. Man, three homers and a double. That one was 109 off the bat and 423 feet. And now Colby Halter floats one foul. Well, if that doesn't get the Gator dugout even more motivated to get the ball down, right? I mean, you know that was the storyline after last night's strikeout fest, but that's a fastball down around the thighs that you can do something with. Now Halter skies this one to shallow right. Braden Joe Bear roams in, and the inning is over. Ty Evans, 423 feet to tie game two in the second. Where is that thing? Over top of the foul pole.
Gators are all tied up. A long home run over that pole for Ty Evans has tied this thing as we go to the bottom of the second. Oh. And Hurston will drip back to work against 8 9 and 1 for LSU. Are you offended if I call that a fair pole? No, I, I, I like that term actually. We'll agree to agree on that. This is yanked by Jordan Thompson, and that is foul. Not fair. You guys agreeing early on. Yeah, what is happening? I'm nervous. Just got nervous. <laughs> Comes the 1 1 to the third year starting shortstop, but he strikes it well, the left center. Uh, Wyatt Lankford for the first down. We're up to eight one run games here in Omaha, and that matches the most we have ever had at this event. Game two, Gators and Tigers to the nine spot, Josh Pearson. Left fielder takes ball one. What a catch Josh Pearson made in the bottom of the 10th on Wyatt Langford yesterday. Dylan Cruz said afterward he was holding his breath for a little bit. He admitted that. There was about 20,000 in here holding their breath when that came off the bat. 2-0. That misses, and it's 3 0 from Hurston Waldrop. Waldrop deals up and away, and a four pitch walk to the nine man Pearson. And the third free pass issued already by Waldrop. So, Mark Wanaka is the first base coach for LSU. He does all their defensive position. They call him Chief. And we're talking to Jay Johnson about it. He's like, you think about all the balls they've caught this week, and there have been quite a few that boy, you're like, wow, that they're getting fortunate. Well, Jay Johnson doesn't really call it fortunate. He says it's it's good planning and great scouting, and that includes the play last night that Josh Pearson made. Dylan Cruz flares one behind Josh Rivera in the left for his second base hit. Two on with one out for LSU in the second. Waldrop likes to get ahead with that breaking ball, and this one isn't a bad pitch. Cruz catches it off the end of the bat, but gets just enough of it. You see that beautiful extension through the ball that allows him to keep it in the air long enough to fall into left field, and here come the Tigers again, man. Just traffic constantly for this offense. Two on after they left him loaded with the one run in the first, and here's Tommy White. Struck out on a splitter his first time, and gets another one to start out. I don't think he's going to get anything but that in this at bat. If, if Waldrop gets ahead, I, I think the entire at bat is going to be split. Talked about how much more off speed there has been from Hurston Waldrop. And White has homered on breaking balls here, so it's another split change. O2 sales at 96. Okay, so Brookie, when you got a guy like this that you know is going to throw your splits, I mean, the longer you stand up there, you know you're going to get him. Or do you go up, and look for it? I mean, if when because there are certain guys that you know I am going to get this. That. Well, I think I don't I don't know that you would sit split, but you're sitting soft in general because there's there's quite a few sliders in there too with Waldrop. So you're, I, I would definitely be sitting soft, not necessarily just on the split. 2-2, two -two. and White pulls it on a rope foul. And that was the slider there, right? So you, you know, it's funny we say soft, it's still 88 miles yeah. an hour, but you, you, you're, the fastball is the off-speed pitch. That's the one that's coming the least amount. It's the one that's out of the speed range of what you're most likely going to see, which is somewhere in that 86 to 89 mile range, whether it's the split Hunt. or the slider. That's what you should be hunting. 2-2 two -two again. White rolls it foul. And, and not just the speed, but then also the, the part of the strike zone, right? So we talk about with a guy like Floyd, you got to push the ball down. With a guy like Waldrop, it's the opposite. You, you're trying to get the ball somewhere around your belly button because that's the breaking ball that should stay in the zone or the split that should stay in the zone. 
But if you chase stuff at the top of your knees, that's the one that bottoms out. 2-2. Two -two. And White on a line into right field, the base hit. Pearson gets waved around to the plate, and LSU leads. You don't accidentally drive in 100 runs. You know what the heck you're doing up there. Tommy White certainly does that. A hanging curveball just up around the belly button, right? We talk about you got to get off speed pitches up. You got to hunt the ball up. And that certainly was a soft breaking ball right around the belt. And Tommy White does what he does best, which is drive in runs. Now 102 on the season. And still only one out here in the second for Trey Morgan. Oh. Takes ball one from Hurston Waldrop. In these first couple of games, the early innings, the approach, the takes, all of that from LSU, been mighty impressive. Morgan in the air, left field, and Shelnut goes back to make the catch. Cruz tags and scores, and it's a Trey Morgan sack fly to make it 3-1 Tigers. What a lineup, KP. Yeah. These guys just know how to put together a bats and execute. Um, I mean, you got a one-out walk to the nine hole hitter, too. You put Pearson on, now you've created traffic, and you got Cruz, White, and Trey Morgan coming right after him. And then Gavin Dugas climbs in here after an RBI double that he torched in the first, then he gets hit. E.T. Ryapel intervened, and now Jeff Head tells Gavin Dugas to go down to first. So Jeff Head just looked at B.T. Ryapel and said, hey, help me out. Help me out. You think you're going to get through two or three games with these two teams and not get a little uh, back and forth? You don't know that league. It can be spicy when Florida and LSU meet up. Two on, two out. Here's Cade Beloso. Walked his first time. It takes ball one. Cut through the splitter. Kate Beloso often found with a smile. Yeah, he just he just smiles a lot. <laughs> that, that's a fun one to be around. Oh. Lays out that it kicks away. And Tommy White moves up. Brian Pell's throw does not get Dugas and now two in scoring position. You got to be ready for the ball in the dirt when you're going up against Waldrop because yes. it's going to happen all game long. Certainly the Tiger offense was ready for that opportunity. So now second and third, 2-1 to Beloso. He's blocked by Ryan Pell. Well, that was pretty right there. He got outside of that ball and brought it right back towards home plate. Sully's searching for answers right now because it just doesn't look like his right-hander has it today. 3-1, outside, ball four. They're loaded again for LSU. So what do you do? Do you go to a more fastball-heavy approach, or do you stick with, even now, 50-plus pitches in the formula that's gotten you here? you got to figure out what you can throw for a strike, because if, if he continue to do this, he's now walked four and hit one. Um, it, it, it doesn't take that much offense to score runs because you're creating so much traffic on your own. Huh. Well, that's a fastball to start out. Hayden Trebinski, who walked his first time with strike one. Big swing and a miss. Now you bury it here, and if you're BT Rypel, got to keep this one in front. 
Oh. That's down. Ryan Pell does. Okay. Here it comes again. Again, Waldrop third in the country in strikeouts. Coming into today is one two. Oh. Up high. Traffic galore for LSU these first couple of innings off Hurston Waldrop. Who delivers the 2 2. Travinsky on the ground and foul the third. That's where he wants to start it. That one just didn't have any bite to it, right? That one just kind of floated. Travinsky actually had an opportunity there, but was just a touch early. 2 2 again. And Trevinsky stays alive on a heater. And look out, cameras. Johnny Lawrence back there. Oh. On the ground, oh, no. foul. Just past Tommy White. Good reminder to all the runners at their base to stay in foul territory. And you get your secondary. <laughs> Having a little laugh about that one. Fair territory or out? Foul territory. Well, it's just foul. See, Little League 101 right there. You learned yep. that? Yeah, bring it out even on the biggest stage. Right. Just got to remind yourself of the fundamentals sometimes. Hey, back in house and waits. Eighth pitch to Travinsky. And he spoils another. Perfect example of the difference in the life of a fastball, right? That's 97 up, yet Travinsky's able to foul it off. Last night from Floyd, we saw a ton of 95s and 96s induce so many swings and misses. Part of his 17 strikeouts. Another 2-2, and this is pulled to third, and Halter ends the inning. So, LSU leads by two. They have left six against Hurston Walter through two. to LSU yesterday as we check out the Capital One Cup standings update as teams compete for a combined five hundred thousand dollars scholarship donation from Capital One. All right on we go to the top of the third and Kate Curlin gets hit by the first pitch from Nate Ackenhausen. Exactly the start you're looking for if you go <laughs> put two on the board. Ackenhausen's first one he just spiked. As he goes through the Florida lineup for a second time. Jay Johnson said afterward as Wyatt Lankford climbs in that on Tuesday in that first Ackenhausen start they were thinking three innings they were thinking 60 pitches. He went out and gave him 18 outs. Lankford walked his first time. Well, we've been talking about Lankford and Cags getting going. Like, you know, you're down, your backs are against the wall right now. Your starter doesn't look like he's got his A plus stuff. This he's all got to start yeah, now. They, they got to get going. A one. Lankford pulls it past Tommy White in the left field. The base hit. Carlin stops it second, and right on cue, Wyatt Lankford arrives here in game two. It's crazy, man. They can hear you down there. You did this yesterday. It's the exact same thing. I mean, does anybody hit the ball harder than Wyatt Langford? Just another 112. Just to just put it on the board. Remember last year, Kemp Alderman was kind of yeah, putting yeah. on this exit velo show. Now, this year it's been Wyatt Langford. For somebody that that only has four hits here in Omaha, it, he's had 110 pluses all over the board. And second time through with Nate Ackenhausen at 44 pitches. You see the bodies spill into the Tiger pen. And now we'll get a visit from, it would appear to be, Jay Johnson. Not to be confused with his pitching coach, no. Wes Johnson. Nope. Nobody would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's putting the brakes on here, and this that bullpen is in full mode of, of all hands on deck right now because 
You're here at the part of the lineup where you might mix and match here as this is the scary part of the Gator batting order. There wasn't like two or three guys that ran down there. I think there was 10. Right. And it's just, we'll let you know, but everybody get down there and get ready. The way it went on Tuesday for Nate Ackenhausen was that Jay Johnson texted him that morning at, in the words of Nate, 8.56 a.m. And Nate texted back his head coach at 11.10 when he woke up <laughs> Texted him back. I'll give it all I got. Those were an anxious few hours for Jay Johnson, who told us pregame we have about three or four big-bodied, bearded lefties who <laughs> like to sleep. <laughs> Atkinhausen still out there against Jack Caglione. Grounded out sharply his first time and rolls this one into center. Curlin scores and Langford and Caglione deliver, and Florida's within a run here in the third. Well, there you go, Gator fans. There's your dude showing up when you need him the most. Felt like Langford missed a chance to go first to third right there, which would have been an added bonus. But Cags getting him on the board here in the third is a big deal. A hard hit grounder up the middle, and Langford's got, look how early he's at second base. The ball's not even close to Dylan Cruz, but I guess just playing, you know, the old adage, you don't want to make the first or third out at third, Langford plays it safe. Now Josh Rivera goes first pitch hunting and pops it up foul. So Langford at second, Caglione at first, but still nobody out. Rivera struck out on a fastball from Ackenhausen back in the first. Kevin O'Sullivan has called Josh Rivera the best shortstop in the country. Swings through that. It's a good change. That's the pitch Ackenhausen felt like he really had Tuesday, like we said. And with the wind blowing in in that one, he threw it a lot. His 0-2. Oh. Rivera lays off. Okay. Yeah, he's going to lean on the off-speed stuff. The slider and changeup have been very effective for him this year, especially against right-handed hitters. 1-2. Rivera on the ground in the left field of base hit. Langford waved around. Pearson's throw is cut, and this game is tied at three. It just kind of felt like it was coming. <laughs> I mean, he didn't know when and exactly what it was going to look like, but this Florida offense is going to wake up at some point. Rivera. Has been fine through all this, but he gets one he can handle. I mean, it's a fair amount of ground balls in this inning. Mm -hmm. Cags a ground ball, Rivera's a ground ball right there. First pitch of the inning hit Keg Curlin, then three straight singles for the Gators to tie it up. And still nobody out as Jay Johnson ponders and BT Riopel bats. Fouls off the first one. Well, all of our other classics have been kind of low scoring nail biters. Maybe we got ourselves a slugfest classic here this afternoon. Gator offense responded right on time. Gavin Gidry, the freshman who's been nails in the second half of the season, is up. Well, that's up high. BT Rypel is headed to a career in finance. Not going to pursue professional baseball. This is his fifth year collegiately. Two of them with the Gators. He's at total peace, he has told us, with that decision. That misses. And he's going to start on July 31st, and he's got all his team at his soon to be new job watching. There could be a bidding war, the, the men's league in Tampa. <laughs> <laughs> because th this is your number one overall pick standing at the plate right now. He's your guy. Two up to him. Yes. And Ryan Bell couldn't resist two and two. The real question is are some of his teammates going to be his first clients? I, I think that would be maybe what's <laughs> next. Seems like a smart move. Yeah. With some of the star power. A few big leaguers on this roster. Back at house and readies. With a 2 2. Pell <laughs> strikes out. One away. Just looking for something that wasn't that. 
Looking for either the change up or the slider. The fastball just stood BT Ryapel straight up. I think that's where being a catcher sometimes you, you overthink things, right? You, you struck out on a breaking ball looking your first time up, and right there, Ryapel was certain he was getting another breaking ball, and boy, he watched a gutter ball right there. So he's punched out twice, and now here's Luke Heyman. Struck out on an elevated fastball his first time in the second. The freshman <laughs> takes strike one. Oh one. That's so oh. funny. So we asked Jay Johnson, by the way, well, when did you text or tell Nate Ackenhausen at this time? And he said, actually, right when he took Ackenhausen out of the game on Tuesday, he said, with confidence, you're starting on Sunday. Still had to win that and two more elimination games at that point when he told the big lefty. Heyman on the ground towards short. Tops in bobbles. And they're loaded for Florida. Well, this is one of those, watch it, it's a one-hand catch, right? So now you flick the transfer. Instead of putting that right hand down there with the catch, for whatever reason, Jordan Thompson on a double play ball only fields that ball with one hand. So then the transfer turns into kind of a flick from the glove to the hand, and he loses it on that transfer. That's why you always want to put your throwing hand on top of the glove in a double play situation so that the release and transfer can happen instantaneously. So now a conversation before Tyler Shellnut bats for the second time after he struck out on a breaking ball his first time back in the second. It's a guy who, unlike Luke Heyman, grew up a huge Gators fan from Lake City, Florida, 50 minutes northwest of Gainesville. Remembers exactly where he was, he told us, when Florida won the national championship in 2017. And here comes Jay Johnson with one out and the bases loaded in the third. I'll tell you what, that, that's a huge miss. You're jogging off the field right there. Hey, Heyman doesn't run real well. I, I think Dugas is going to finish that double play. Instead, you got the bases loaded and one out. Big moment here for the freshman running in. Forced to make a move to the rookie, Gavin Gidry. Onto the bump in game two in the finals at the College World Series after this. Oh, that'll do it for Nate Ackenhausen today. It was so good in his first start here in Omaha's first start of the year. Six innings, did not give up a run. Today, the control the arm side was actually pretty good early. But then it was creating more traffic into that arm side. Jumped on a little bit late. Single to left by Langford, another one from Rivera. Struck out Ryapel looking, and then an error on what could have been a double play ball will end up ending the day a little bit earlier than the boys in gold were hoping for. And he will give way to the freshman from Lake Charles, Louisiana, Gavin Gidry, who arrived as a two way player and has stepped up to be a massive part of this bullpen. That's kind of a short arm. It, it, it's, I mean, which is what it is. It looks like a shortstop that's on the mound from an arm pass standpoint. But it's mid 90s, and the, the breaking ball is really good. That's that's where Gidry excels is when he gets into those counts. And it's heavy usage. It, it, if you're Florida right now, you're you're sitting up there looking for a breaking ball. We saw Hunter Inslee from Tennessee hit a first pitch breaking ball out against Gidry in Game One of the LSU Tennessee series here in Omaha and so you know Florida's got a, a similar game plan it's 67 percent breaking balls mm. Gavin was telling us the other day how well his slider plays because of the fastball characteristics and so he feels like that breaking ball is so good off of his fastball and that's why he has leaned so heavily on it here at his freshman season Shellnut with the bases loaded and one out in the third. Breaking ball to start out, and Shellnut was swinging. Jack Caglione had a run scoring single. So did Josh Rivera, who followed him in the cleanup spot. And then Luke came and got aboard as well to load him up. That's a strike, and it's nothing at two.
Oh, two. Cut on and missed. Two down. That's what he does. <laughs> He's going to throw that one. Shell not expanded the zone on the first. Gidry landed it to get to 02 and then expand the zone right there. You're, you're going to get a ton of them. Just whether or not he has the ability to throw it for called strikes and whether this Florida lineup has the ability to lay off those in arm. Well, it brings up Ty Evans, the home run hitter, back in the second. Breaking ball to start, and Evans skies this one down the line and left toward the uh -oh, corner. Uh -oh. Pearson back at the wall. Uh -oh. The ball is gone. It's a grand slam for Evans. Twice to the pole. Kidding me. That ball was hit to the clouds. <laughs> and we knew at some point the win was going to be a factor today, but that's the first one where it has really shown up. 51 degree launch, a first pitch breaking ball hit to the sky. 51 degrees. Are you kidding me, KP? Still 109 off the bat, but backspin and win carries this one out off the bat. He thought maybe it was going to go foul, but it wasn't going to leave. Instead, it's a grand slam for Ty Evans. And the Gators strike back with five here in the third. He's now homer twice in the last two innings. And it's a four-run Florida lead in game two after dropping game one to LSU last night. Wow. And how big's that double play ball now? One out to Colby Halter, a wave and a miss on a fastball. I don't know that I've ever heard of a 51 degree home run. I certainly have not. We'll, we'll get on that. I, I, there's probably been one, but that's about as high as you'll ever hear. Halter rolls it. Uh, Trey Morgan to end the inning. Kevin O'Sullivan told us that he had a feeling. He told one of his associate athletic directors before this, Ty Evans is going to play a role in this thing in Omaha. And boy, has he. Ty Evans now the second player in Florida history with a grand slam at the Men's College World Series, joining Brad Wilkerson, who had a granny in 1996. Feels a little different now for Hurston Waldron. Oh. Back to work in the bottom of the third against the bottom third in the LSU lineup, starting with Braden Jobert. Grounded to second his first time. 2 0 from Waldron. What I've found is that the lowest homer launched, 13.5 yep. by Giancarlo Stanton, and the highest that I've found is 49.7 by JD Martinez. That one was 51. An average, you know this stuff really 28 well. 28 to 32 is the average. That's a strike. So basically a, a 60 degree wedge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hit 400 feet, yeah. give or take. Unreal. Gobert takes, and it's a leadoff walk to begin this bottom of the third for LSU. Sully can't be happy about that. Jay Johnson was certainly not happy when Ackenhausen hit Curlin to start the last inning. And thought maybe the five spot would, or excuse me, the six spot would settle Waldrop down. Not the case. So it brings up Jordan Thompson. Well, Boy, you think back to that play as well for Jordan Thompson at short. And you mentioned the, the one hand versus two hands mm -hmm. fielding. Not every air costs your team a run, but that one, that one will sting. He squares and pulls <laughs> back and takes a strike. Thompson's story has been well told. He had 33 errors his first two years combined, but by and large this year has been much better now as a junior defensively. Oh, no. Two and one. Part of the defensive issues last year were knee surgery for Thompson three weeks before the start of last year. 
Pulls this one foul, two and two. Well, Gators is inning. I mean, it's been almost all fastballs. They're just they're trying to find something that Waldrop can throw for a strike. And come back and give him the ability to throw the split. Still significantly more balls than strikes thus far. Breaking ball strikes out Thompson for round number one in the third. That was one of his better sliders mm -hmm. today. That's one he really got on top of and, and had a little bit more depth. A few of them have kind of hung in the zone. That one, really, when he needed one right there, was not as good as he's thrown today. Paul Skeens leads the country in strikeouts, of course. And then Stanford star Quinn Matthews. Huh. Now two ahead. Hurston Waldrop pumps in strike one to the nine man Josh Pearson, who worked that one out walk his first time in the second. Oh, splitter away. Waldrop admitted after his last start last Sunday here against Oral Roberts, it took him some time to settle in. He said on a big stage, obviously a lot of adrenaline and the emotions that come with this place. Now he's got a four run lead here. Two one. A pop. Oh. One of the things he's learned from Brandon Sprode is what we talked about yesterday. He will also talk to himself. And inside that white hat, it says, the will to win, I won't be stopped. There's also a superstition there. We'll only pitch wearing the white hat. Pearson pulls this one foul. White hat guy, huh? Sharp. Mm -hmm. You approve? Well, whatever the starting pitcher wants, right? He's the one with the ball in his hand, so. We need him to feel comfortable. Whatever you want, KP. We're behind you. I appreciate it. Kyle did text us today and say, Gray's question mark? Yes, that's right. We let him call it. Uh, it wasn't really calling it. It, it, it was it was suggesting. That's all it was. Yeah. I appreciate you for saying this guy. This is like my white hat. That's right. It's the exact same thing. If you want gray, we'll wear gray. We need you to throw strikes and pitch us into the seventh. Is that all right? That's fair. Okay. That's a good trade. Three two. Pearson pulls another one foul. Only one of us, though, spent a very long time with an iron and a steamer today. <laughs> Struggling. <laughs> Struggling. I remember my first time with an iron. <laughs> Hang in there, Mike. Wear it, kid. Hang with it. KP Berkey and Monaco upstairs. Chris Button down at field level. 3-2 again. Oh, oh. This is second walk of the inning, and Hurston Waldrop did not like it. Jeff Head is making him throw it over the white part of the plate today. That one was actually over the plate. I guess he called it down. Josh Pearson, one for 20 in the Men's College World Series, and Hurston Waldrop has walked him twice, and I guess Jeff Head is pointing that that was down. Man, he's had a tight one here today. And so back to the top for the Golden Spikes Award winner, Dylan Cruz, who has singled twice huh. and takes strike one. Berkey, you asked Dylan Cruz before this started about if this is the cherry on top of his career, checking the box of Omaha. He said it's the whipped cream. Cherry on top would be winning the whole thing. Well, we didn't even ask him about the Golden Spikes. Just throw that one in there. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Man, what a career. He has checked every box but winning the whole thing. You're certainly positioned to do that. Waldrop, so too. You know, what, I, what I would say about Dylan Cruz, too, that I just think can't be said enough is how he's handled himself through it all. He is, day one. He is a humble, humble man. And it's pretty cool that he gets the limelight. Dylan, get he ball, gets get hit ball. here. And so two walks and a hit batter from Hurston Waldrop have loaded the bases for LSU here in the third. This is eight. Eight free base runners in the first three innings. Let's see, would they, would they challenge that? Ooh, they they should challenge that. Doesn't look like they're going to. So the letter of the law is this: if you are judged to intentionally make a movement to be hit by a pitch, it's a strike. Yeah, that's a huge switch in this game. 
Did the ball hit you or did you hit the ball in any way? And Sully doesn't look like he's going to review it. And that is that is a missed opportunity. Let's see if BT says anything to him when he walks out there. And it, <clears throat> I still don't think that they're going to, but at that point, they're definitely not going to now. We didn't know it would be this offensive, but you felt like for Florida to have a, a real chance, he had to get him into the sixth or seventh. He won't. They'll go to the bullpen right now, but they lead it by four. Somebody got to go all night. Somebody got to dig down deep. Mean what they say, say what they mean. Yeah, the way I see, might as well be me. Tommy White's had some memorable swings for LSU here in Omaha and he's got three of LSU's seven grand slams this season. Hurston Waldrop exits with the bases loaded here in the third inning. Yeah, that, that, that's a rough one. six walks he hit two. He left the bases loaded in each of the first two innings. LSU's had him load at least once so they'll go to Blake Purnell who hasn't pitched in a month. Since the SEC tournament, it's a, a low slot two seamer, a guy that can roll you a lot of ground balls when he's right, but maybe hadn't quite had the year that he did last year. Last year, he was closing for a period of time. This year, coming in at a massive spot for Florida. Kevin O'Sullivan said last night, we're going to need some other guys to step up on the mound. And I feel confident they will, but it's guys who haven't even stepped onto this surface yet. And earlier than expected, for the Gators here in game two needing to win trying to force a decisive game three tomorrow. Point. Tommy White struck out his first time and then had an RBI single in the second. First pitch inside ball one from that low slot. It's a hundred and two RBIs now for Tommy White. The 1 0. White on the ground towards short. Rivera flips. Curlin turns, and it's two. Inning over. Well, it doesn't get any bigger than that, boys. What a play by the Gator defense. Just when it was getting shaky, Blake Purnell comes in and gets them off the field. Gator still up four. Welcome back to Omaha, joined with LSU head coach Jay Johnson. With Ackenhausen done early and knowing what you have today and a possibility of tomorrow, how do you manage your arms? Just one pitch at a time. I mean, they're in a bind, too, with Gus getting Waldrop out of the game. We just need to cash in and a couple more of those opportunities. So we're going to try to keep it close, so they have to keep going, to guys. What was the message to your guys on the bus ride over this morning, knowing what you could be celebrating today, but also knowing you have to get a job done? Yeah, task at hand. You can't go there. If you go there, it takes you out of your plan. And when we stay in plan, we're a pretty good baseball team, so we're trying to do that the best we can. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. In search, Chris, of the program's seventh national title. Only USC has more with a dozen. Tigers' last one was in 2009, and they're on the doorstep after back-to-back -back wins in 11 innings apiece. What? To the fourth. It's been eventful so far. Third time through the Florida lineup, starting oh. with Cade Curlin, who gets ball one from Gavin Guidry. You know, I... We're not used to saying this here, but this could end up being like a Rosenblatt score. Just the, yep. way, <laughs> the way it feels here early. 1 0 pitch. Hey. Well, how about this? It's seven runs on the board for Florida. They're the first team in this year's College World Series to get seven in a game. We're just getting rubbed up. Oh. Outside 2 and 1 on Curlin. I don't think this one's going to end 7 3. Gidry deals. Bounces it in. 3 and 1. Well, I think the, the wind blowing out changes the entire psyche of the pitching staff, right? Because they know the mistakes could cost them more as opposed to the way they normally feel standing on the mound here. And, 
is feeling fearless to challenge in the strike zone. And it's a leadoff walk. Cade Curland is on for the third time. Hey, the first round of this year's NHL draft is Wednesday at 7 Eastern on ESPN and ESPN Plus. The Blackhawks won the lottery. They've got the rights to Connor Bedard. Wednesday, 7 Eastern on ESPN and ESPN Plus. And we have heard so many different pitchers talk about the wind blowing in and how that's empowered them mm -hmm. out there. Here's Wyatt Langford. Rolls this Hello. one foul outside of third. Yeah, Ackenhausen was talking about him. To where the other day he said, I, I got behind him, just throw a 2 0 change up and let him try to hit it as far as you possibly can. That doesn't work today. He even went so far to talk about exit velocities. He said, Guys were hitting it 108 off the bat, which is tagged, and I knew it would be an out. Langford has walked and singled so far. 0 1 from Guidry. Off the end of the bat, squibbed into the shift. Dugas a long way to go, and he doesn't get Langford. Who can burn? Yeah, it, it's we've talked about it plenty this year, but now the whole country's getting to see it. Speed to me is the thing that's not talked about with Langford, um, and, and it's what may give him a chance to stick at center field when it gets into pro ball. I mean, this is a squibber and a weird one, and you're playing him more shaded up the middle anyway, all the way out in front, and then spinning all over the place. Dugas gets there, but. He puts his head down and goes, Berkey. He can he can pick him up and move him. Yeah, I mean he's safe easily at first base. Boy, the Gators, here comes Jay Johnson. Yeah, the Gators are, are are not done. We're used to seeing 110 plus from White Langford. That one was 59. Not the hardest single of his career. Going to get into some interesting places in the bullpen today, yeah. I think. It's Bryce Collins, the right-hander, up and throw him. Real quick on the um, Ty Evans home run. Please. The StatCast article I pulled up during break said that the, the batting average on balls 50 degrees or higher was 0.014. That's one out of 100. One out of 100 <laughs> that historically a that's a hit. Forget home run. We put the fine folks of ESPN stats and info on it as well as Ty sizes up ball flight still in the dugout and there has not been an over the fence home run hit that high since we've had stat cast going back to 2015 ever ever <laughs> and I don't think anybody would have predicted uh, Charles Schwab Stadium to be the first it's not Bluto 0, 0.0 but it's close 0 1 4. Jack Caglione against Gavin Guidry. Whoa. Ball one to start out. Sharp ground out, run scoring single to center for Caglione. He talked with Chris Button before the game about the conditions and just trying to do less, maybe not swinging as hard and just letting his natural strength do the work. Duo to short. That's Gavin Dugas to Thompson, who will hold it and then throws it away. Curling scores. And it's a five run lead. Oh, the second big blunder from Jordan Thompson gives the Gators a run. Well, and, and it looked like because he put it in his pocket and didn't turn the double play, he's trying to catch Curland off of third base. And then right when he goes to throw it, he second guesses himself. Yeah. Almost looked like he was trying to, to, to read. And then it just, oh, like he wanted to change his mind. And he ends up just letting it go. And that one is a decision he'd like to have back. And now the umpires come together here after Jay Johnson came out. LSU is challenging to slide at second base. The previous play is under review. So this is interesting. Over at second on a Wyatt Langford slide into the turn for Thompson. Is he sliding into the base? He is for me. Yeah. 
I mean, you could go to the inside part of the base, which he was right there. He was. Yeah, his left foot goes right into the middle of the base. Yeah. Or his right foot, yeah. excuse me. His frame of his body got outside the base, but his, his right foot's right into the middle of the bag. It's the force play slide rule. The runner cannot slide or run out of the baseline in the direction of the fielder. A raised leg cannot make contact higher than the fielder's knee when the fielder is in a standing position and slide toward or contact the infielder, even if the infielder doesn't make an attempt to throw to complete a play, like in this case. I think the only thing about this would be when you were reading the rule, the raised leg component of the slide as to whether or not it's making contact above the knees. The call on the field of no force play slide rule interference is confirmed. The runner at second base is out. Everybody else advances. All right. Nicely done by Jeff Head and the crew. Jay Johnson with a challenge that comes up empty. You get two of them, you keep them if you're successful. That was the first one from LSU here, four innings in. So it's 8-3 now, Florida in front, top of the fourth, and Josh Rivera. With Jack Caglione aboard at first against Gavin Guidry. Big lead, and Caglione oh. goes, Travinsky's throw. <laughs> Surprise you guys, he's running. It was Look a how big massive lead. <laughs> massive <laughs> lead. <laughs> was he out? Oh, I don't know. That is close. It looks like indeed they did get him. And now Kevin O'Sullivan chatting with his star Jack Caglione. Nice job by Trevinsky. I mean, the, the, that kind of lead, you would expect him to have been safe. And Dugas did a nice job of finishing it off on the back end. Caglione, who was four for five stealing bags this year. And now one and two on Josh Rivera with now two outs and the base is empty. Gidry fires. And that's it. Strikes out Rivera. Another run for Florida off the LSU error in the fourth. All right, game two, how did LSU get to this point? Well, they've got the best pitcher in the country in Paul Skeens. He has dazzled. Three straight elimination game wins, including a couple against Wake Forest and a bullpen headlined by Riley Cooper that stepped up with LSU trying to win another national championship. Riley Cooper's been really been good. Phenomenal. You said Berkey last night, maybe as valuable as anyone for the Tigers. Yeah, I mean, right now, if you were picking MVPs, I think for the Gators, oh, it'd be Ty Evans. Got to win a three save. Yeah, and for the Tigers, it, he would certainly be in the mix. Skeens and Beloso. Oh, I mean, there's. Ty Floyd's got, oh, just 27 strikeouts in two starts here. Not bad. A lot of pieces for LSU down by five against Florida here in game two in this best of three. Lake Purnell misses and it's 2-0 and to start out Trey Morgan in the three spot for the Tigers in the fourth. Again Purnell is KP told you working for the first time since late May against Vanderbilt. Huh. And really working for just the second time in the last seven weeks. Because when he pitched in the SEC tournament in Hoover, Alabama, it's his first time out there in three weeks. Oh. And misses three and one. That's Ryan Slater, trusted arm on this staff, one of the most used options for Florida and Kevin O'Sullivan. Three one. Misses and another leadoff walk. 
That's been the issue with Purnell this year. Coming into this ball game, 13 walks and 18 and a third. 18 hits as well. So he's had a ton of traffic in his appearances this year. Last year, he was so reliable for him. But one thing he can do is what he did to get out of last inning, which is roll some, some double play balls. Now it's Gavin Dugas to face Purnell. RBI double and Dugas hit by another pitch. DT Rypel trying to settle Blake Purnell in. Kevin O'Sullivan has talked about Purnell, and when the velocity is more 86 to 88 than 90 to 91, it's better. Sinks more, and they want him to live there. That's at 90 yeah. for a called strike. That, that one right there is the one that gets it. Is the it just kind of stays there at 90. It's many sinker, ball, sinker ballers are that way, to where when you're not trying to throw as hard, it really allows that hand to finish over the top of the baseball and give it that down movement. On the ground to short. Curlin's turn, two again. That was 88. Got the sink, got the ground ball. Boy, a couple big double plays by this Gator middle infield, and Rivera's had a couple tricky hops, doing a nice job of just finishing the catch before you think about the transfer. And the second baseman, Curlin, with a couple clean turns. That erases that leadoff walk. So Morgan retired on the twin killing, and now Cade Beloso <laughs> takes strike one. We had the footage earlier of Cade's father, who had the grill working with a gator on it. Pretty big one, too, taking up the whole grill out in lot D. Free game outside the chuck here today, ahead of game two. He said it was a 25-pound gator. <laughs> It wasn't small. You know where you don't find those? In the Missouri River. <laughs> you can't just run up to High V right here and go buy a 25 pound gator. What one decayed. Oh. Misses. So Hot Rod, as he's known, showed off to our camera crew earlier today. It's some Bayou dust sprinkled on. You have to, you may have to run down some of that Bayou dust. So, do we think he traveled with the like? Wh wh where did where did he uh, acquire this this gator? Like, is that at the? Uh... I think you got to travel with it, right? I, would, I, I think Chris knows. <laughs> I talked to Kate about it when I came into the dugout to start the game, and he looked at me. He's like, "Did you see my dad? Did you run into him? Did you get some gator?" And he goes, "My dad right now is in his prime, living his best life out here." <laughs> And Cade walks for the third time in four innings. Second walk of the inning and a two out base runner. Maybe maybe that one was on ice. I think it had to be. KP already told you about the layout here in all bodies of water. You can't find that at the, at the local market. No. No, if so, I haven't been in that aisle yet. <laughs> So man aboard and we'll get a conference for Hayden Travinsky catcher in the sixth spot with his head coach. Get the barrel below the ball. This is the opposite of the uh, typhoid approach, right? The ball's sinking. He's trying to get you to hit the top of it. Try to get the barrel below the ball and see if you can't get the ball in the air. Whereas with, with the high spin, top of the zone guys, you're trying to get the barrel. You're trying to feel like your barrel's above the ball and staying as flat as possible. The nuances of facing different types of arms and pitches. Travinsky has walked and crowded out to third against the sinker baller Blake Purnell. Oh. So how do you how do you do that as a hitter? Like practically speaking, is it changing where you start your swing or, or the entire swing path changes too? Well, yeah, you know, you're definitely going to work a little bit lower to higher and just just think about trying to get to the bottom of the ball. Hey, corner. 
easier said than done, I think. But these are the things that sometimes you, you train for, right? Hey, we're facing a sinker ball or we're facing a high spin guy. Like the, the different types of opportunities that appear in games, you got to have you got to have different types of moves. Right. If you're trying to use the backside of the field, if you're trying to get the head out, these are all the little things that guys spend their careers trying to refine. Point. Well, Purnell's got a one ball, two strike count with two outs here in the fourth. Oh. Inside. Two two on the ground to short and Rivera flips to Curly. Kevin O'Sullivan visits with Chris Button when we come back to Omaha, Nebraska. Sullivan, I got two words for you. Ty Evans, uh, you told our guys earlier this week that you kind of feel like he was going to make a presence here. What did you see out of him that led you to believe that? I just felt like his BP was just getting better and better, and he was staying in the middle of the field, and um, you know, our coaches worked awfully hard. He's a really hard worker, and just kind of felt like with his makeup and the way he put, you know, the way his swing was starting to come around, felt like he had a chance to do something special out here. You go with Blake Purnell, he gets you out of that big inning and another one. Hasn't pitched in a couple weeks. What did you like about him in that moment? Well, he did exactly what he needed to do. He got a ground ball with uh, with Tommy up and, um, you know, he just got to sink the ball, throw it across plate. We got a decision to make move forward because I know we go left, right, left coming up, so we might go to the pen. Thank you, Sully. Thank you. All right, so all the pitching permutations now for both these teams have really come to the forefront here in game two. Yeah, when you draw it up ahead of time, this isn't the way that either one of them draw it up. For Florida, you're saying, all right, we need we need length out of Walter. He's got to get us into the sixth or the seventh to save this bullpen. And I don't, I don't know if Jay Johnson thought that Bryce Collins would be the game in the fifth inning today either. For Collins, over the course of the year, it's an ERA in the mid sevens. He's curveball heavy. You can see he's walked a guy in inning this year. Throws more curveballs than fastballs. Fastball has good velo. I mean, he could show you some 94s and fives, but when he has success, it's usually because the curveball's good. Two to one curveball yep. to fastball. So similar to Gidry, that from an approach standpoint, if you're in that Florida lineup, you're hunting a breaking ball. He's coming in to pitch here in game two of the men's college World Series finals and pitching for the first time since May 14th for LSU. Who trails Florida by five as we start the fifth. Five, six, and seven, beginning with BT Ryapel, who sees 94 for ball one. LSU led 3 1 into the third when Florida hung six on the Tigers. Ryapel lines it into center field, the base hit to lead things off. That's not a, a home run. That's a single. Yeah. No, no, no. Not, yeah, not an extra base hit. His first one of the NCAA tournament. BT Ryapel and this Gator offense keeps it rolling. That's pretty wild. Opposing pitchers in the postseason have even said it about BT Ryapel that it seems like every one of his hits goes over the fence. Teammates have laughed about it. So of course he's got a leadoff knock of the base hit variety in the fifth hey. in front of Luke Heyman who takes strike one. Heyman reached on that fielder's choice and error by Thompson back in the third. High and tight one and one. This is where you sit breaking ball. First pitch breaking ball for a strike fastball at your nose. Probably getting the hook right here. One one. Collins obliges on a line right at Dylan Cruz for out number one. Hard game. Luke, Luke Heyman did everything right there. There's just that guy named Cruz standing out there. Bad A. Work on your torts. <laughs> like Berkey on the putting green. Yeah. And more good positioning from Mark Wanaka and the LSU staff. Now Tyler Shelnut oh. takes ball one off the edge from Bryce Collins. Shelnut finally a Florida Gator after a couple of years of junior college. Pops up a bunt toward third and foul. A 
nice day on this Sunday afternoon here at Charles Schwab Field. A little bit cooler than it had been for yep. most of this, and the wind blowing more briskly. On the ground, foul again. Temperatures have brought a different wind direction, which has led to a little more offense today. What is that wind direction? What do we got today? Pretty good. Yeah. For the northeast. Shell that spread. That's Iowa. Foul. That's yeah. Iowa right there. It was east yes. of the state of Nebraska. Yeah. So if you ever kind of need a cheat code. Yeah, that's, I got there. Okay. I got there. You can go on that bridge to Iowa. One, two. Shell nut on a line right center and Cruz with a great jump. That guy's still out there. Two go. There's that guy again. Boy, he just like minimizes the gaps. It feels like there's big gaps here, except three looks like he's all over the place. You almost take him for granted because it feels like he's, he doesn't leave his feet a ton, right? But yet, ball didn't get on Ends the ground up too glove. much there. <laughs> so Cruz puts it away, and now here is the two word sensation that Budden talked about with Kevin O'Sullivan, Ty Evans. <laughs> Four home runs for Evans, including two, including that grand slam in this game. And there was a time early in the season when he was pleading with Kevin O'Sullivan to stick with him. Kevin O'Sullivan told us early this season, Ty Evans our best option to win the last game of the year. And at one point, Ty texted his head coach at 8.30 in the morning and said, Coach, I got to talk to you. Don't give up on me. I know I've been struggling over the course of the last few weeks. And now he's doing this kind of stuff. Let's check out the launch. This one was a little more normal, 32 degrees, a bomb at 424 feet. This one is as abnormal as they get, folks. 51-degree launch. Got that tailwind. Ackenhausen can't believe it. Two homer day for Ty Evans, pretty special. Strikes out here in the top of the fifth. Halfway through Florida by five. Brings back the warm and fuzzies. Rosenblatt was a, was a neat place. Well, now here in the bottom of the fifth of game two at the Chuck, Nick Ficarota, fourth year sophomore, takes over. And like Blake Purnell, he hasn't pitched a whole lot recently. First outing since three weeks ago in the regionals against UConn. Before that, an outing in the SEC tournament for just an inning and a third. Mm. So throwing for only the third time in the last seven weeks. And he gets seven, eight, and nine. And starts out with strike one to Braden Jobert. Ground out in a walk for Jobert so far. Oh. One and one. And you heard Sully reference the fact that they had three lefties coming up and so he goes to Ficarota because he likes the change up first the left handers here from LSU there's back to back change ups that miss yeah. but that's that's the thought process here. Two one hey. is a strike with a fastball. Yeah the pitching management on both sides gets really interesting now. Bottom of the fifth, five-run game, and Florida leading. This is line towards center. Wyatt Langford runs it down. Nice jump there by Wyatt Langford to put away a ball that was smoked in the gap. Both our star center fielders making some range plays. You think the speed will give Langford a shot to stick out there in center? He has the physical tools to play the position. Yeah. He needs the reps, right? That doesn't mean he'll ever be oh, yeah. maybe quite to Cruz's level defensively, but uh, he he could be. Nobody ever thought he'd be able to be. I mean, he came as a catcher, right? Nobody thought he'd be a real left fielder, and he did that fantastically. I wouldn't put it past him, and the offense is going to be so loud that I think even if he's not world class, if he's if he does well enough boy what a valuable weapon out there in center to have that kind of power. 
Ball and a strike on Jordan Thompson. That's outside. Kylie McDaniel has a new mock draft that's going up on ESPN.com first thing tomorrow morning. Wyatt Langford right now going third overall. We can give you a little teaser of that. So that leaves Skeens and Cruz. He's got Paul Skeens first overall, Dylan Cruz second, and then Wyatt Langford third. Can't give the whole thing. So it's with Kylie's permission. So Kylie moves Skeens up. To number one? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. And that's nothing that Cruz or Langford did wrong. It's just Paul Skeens has been that great. He's done a whole lot right. <laughs> Looking forward to reading that from Kylie. Always drops some great knowledge on his mock drafts. Uh -oh. Thompson runs into this one to left center with Langford back to make the catch on the track. Two down. The Tigers looking to get Jordan Thompson going, and that, that wind is uh, is helping, but the ballpark's still big. Thompson didn't quite get enough of that one. Now stuck in a one for 29 here in Omaha. So two gone and to the nine spot for Josh Pearson, who's walked each of his first two times. Well, Ficarota's first misses for ball one. <laughs> That's a strike with a fastball. Pearson flicks it foul one and two. So when do we start having the discussion of will you see Paul Skeens at all tomorrow if we get to game three. Sounds like we're having it now. <laughs> With two strikes and two outs. Off the glove of Jack Cagliode. <laughs> Pearson singles with two outs, and the conversation can continue. All right, so obviously long way to go, right? Bottom of the fifth, two outs. Going to be an offensive day with both these teams, the way the park is playing. But if there is a game three tomorrow, what does happen? Jay Johnson, the only thing he said to us on the topic pregame today was that Paul Skeens is unavailable today. Yes. To be fair, we did not ask the question about tomorrow either. We're going to do that today. So when Paul Skeens walked off the bus today, we asked him, and he said, not today, maybe tomorrow. We also asked him, what would be your sales pitch to Jay Johnson to let him know you wanted in the ball game? Because I would look him in the eye and say, I feel good. Short and sweet. Dylan Cruz fouls it off. Ball at a strike. He's reached base all three times. If he said, I feel good, would you give him the ball? I don't know. I, I don't know it's I think it's a discussion that is not just him and Paul I think that there's others that are probably involved in that discussion. Again we are talking about the best pitcher in the country surefire talent Golden Spikes Award finalist and projected number one overall pick and Kylie's mock coming out tomorrow. Kevin O'Sullivan will visit Nick Ficarota here with two and one the count and two down here at the bottom of the fifth. But if you do see him tomorrow I'd be surprised if it's in a start. I think you figure out the number of pitches that you're that you're comfortable with using in that spot and you pick the biggest highest leverage spot in the entire game and that's where you do and if you're not going to use them I don't know if we talked about this on air or not yesterday. I would still trot him down to the bullpen in the fifth or sixth because this place would go crazy. You know, are, you, are there different things that you're doing on the Florida side because you think potentially you're going to see skiing? So, regardless, I would have him go down there at some point. Tomorrow right. would be three days rest. Yep. Coming off 120 pitches. Cruz fouls that one off two and two. Pearson aboard at first with two outs in the last of the fifth. 
Picarota's 2 2. Inside. For the sake of the discussion, you would expect Florida to counter with Jack Caglione. Yeah, I think that one's a lot. Up to 99 on the mound this year is their number three starter. Cruz chops it. Halter charges. Cruz can fly, and Halter got it there in time. Nicely done by Colby Halter. Still a long way to go in this one. We go to the sixth. It's Florida up on LSU by five. Dyke on the ground. He'll come home with it. Rivera tags Robertson. Boom! Lippin with the bases loaded. Deacon Lippin makes it 5-1 Florida. On the ground to second. And the Gators get their first College World Series championship. That was six years ago in 2017 for Florida and an all SEC showdown in the finals this year for a conference synonymous with this event. Florida's in the finals for the fourth time in program history also in 2011 and in 2005. Trying to win game two and force a game three. Nine one and two here in the six, starting with Colby Halter. Bryce Collins came on in the fifth, and Halter tags this one to right center field, back toward the wall, and it one hops off the wall. Colby Halter with a leadoff double to begin the sixth. Maybe there are certain spots that even he can't get to. <laughs> Cruz was shading him a little bit the opposite way right mm -hmm. there too and, and Halter really got through this that stayed true all the way out towards center field and you see that number three real quick that's not a comfortable feeling on the mound nine hole hitter right there with the leadoff double and the Gators back in business here in the sixth Halter's had some fine moments here in the NCAA tournament and in particular in Omaha Kate Curlin gets hit by a pitch he's made a habit of that second time in this game and now the fourth time he's been aboard in all his trips and the first two are on for Florida in the sixth. This Florida offense just in position to pour it on here this afternoon. Curlin getting on base four times is definitely the formula that the Gators are looking for. Now Jake Johnson, the LSU head coach, comes out to chat, at least at first, with home plate umpire Jeff Head. On his way out to the mound. We came in talking about it, the top of the lineup for Florida had to step up in this finals. And here in game two, with the Gators' backs against the wall, and they've stepped up. Yeah, they definitely have. And to a certain degree, it's just a matter of time, right? Like, I mean, they're just too much talent yep. with those first three guys that they weren't going to get it going. But I think it, it helps the conditions are a little more offensive. And then, you know, all great players need is just a little sign of good fortune, right? Just something to make them flip the script on what's well, been going sideways for him like a like a great shooter seeing the first one go in and well, this Gator offense looks pretty scary right now. Saw Blake money out in the bullpen for LSU. It's a walk a single to the pull side and then an infield single for Wyatt Langford his last time in the fourth. Hey. Halter and Curlin aboard. First pitch. Mighty swing from Wyatt Langford. You've called him a blue collar superstar. Kevin O'Sullivan said to us, I've never had a player this good fly under the radar quite like he has. Uh -oh. And he tags it. Left field and launched by Wyatt Langford. Destroyed. 
the ball he hit last night would have ended up in the same place in that any backspin. Yeah. This is this is about as good as you can do it. A hanging slider, and he now has the two farthest balls in the history of Charles Schwab Field. Just a bomb fest that Wyatt Langford is putting on here at the College World Series, and just another 114 off the bat. He is an exit velocity factory <laughs> himself. Yeah. Team in 449, 456, and 449 so far for his two homers. Again, we hadn't had a team put up seven runs in a game here. Florida's got 11 on the board in the six with nobody out. Jack Caglione had an RBI single in the third. Oh. Just feels like Wyatt Lankford is always in a position in the box to do damage. Just the look yes. of him. Yes, it's so solid, stable, and simple. Uh oh. Caglione the opposite way. And that is back toward the wall. And gone! Back to back for the Gators. Number 32 for Jack Caglione. Breaking a, rod, a lot of droughts here today, KP. Oppo launch piece for Jack Tawney. And how about the inning for the Gators? Double hit by pitch, homer, homer. And that'll bring some smiles to that Gator bench. Kirtland Langford. Caglione, who we had talked about coming in. 12 combined plate appearances today. They've reached base 11 times. That is something. That's flipping it right there. Yeah, that would that, qualify. Yes. That is flipping it. And how about a dozen home runs for this Florida team at this men's college World Series? Caglione had been tied with Wake Forest Brock Wilkin for the national lead and now Jack Caglione alone. Josh Rivera chops it at Tommy White and it kicks off his glove and everything is coming up Gators. I mean they, they've done everything right since they got into the elimination game you got to win three in a row to get to this point for LSU yesterday it was clean and, and today it just today just didn't their day but you win the first one today doesn't have to be mm -hmm. your day because it looks like we will be playing again tomorrow Blake money was up in that LSU bullpen the gate is open and that means he's going to run in Tigers back to the bullpen but a lot of work to do they trail it 12 3. One of his two home runs in this game two in Omaha in the men's college World Series finals. LSU took game one 4 3 in 11 innings last night, and Florida trying to force a decisive game three that would be tomorrow night at 7 o'clock right here on ESPN. Blake Money takes over in this cavalcade of arms that spill out of the Tigers' pen. Former Little League World Series star now back out there for LSU on for the 20th time. Money does have a few starts this year, so you could be taking the rest of the way if you're LSU trying to save the rest of that bullpen. For Money, a fair amount of sliders against right handers. He'll throw more sliders and fastballs. Fastball velocity into the low 90s can get up 94 95. Takes over for Bryce Collins. Came on in the fifth. That served up the back to back home runs for Florida here in the sixth. BT Ryapel with still nobody out for the Gators, leading by nine. One of the other things Jay Johnson said to his pregame down in the dugout was that he really wanted to avoid using Riley Cooper in a situation where, obviously, closer than this. 
and wanted to be able to get him rest in case there is a game three. Because, like we talked about earlier, Riley Cooper's pitched a ton, and he's been that good for LSU. Well, I, I think on the flip side of that, the Tigers don't want to use Riley Cooper. If Florida can win this game and not have to use Brandon Neely, yeah. who threw 54 pitches yesterday, that's a a huge shot in the arm for a bullpen that's that's a little short as well, right? So, you know, if, if Florida can keep this lead comfortable, they can give Neely a day off, and now both teams will be back to their closers. One, two. Oh. Think about Kate Fisher as well. Freshman left who came mm -hmm. out of the Florida pen for three and a third yesterday. Who really, aside from the one swing, threw the ball great. He threw 50 that. pitches. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One swing was important. It's outside oh. and a full count on Ryan Pell. Couple strikeouts and a single so far for BT Ryapel here in game two. 3 2, runner goes and it's cut on and miss. Ryapel strikes out. So one gone. First base had been occupied by Josh Rivera. I think I've ever seen a first baseman get that close to the catcher to let him know he didn't need to throw it. Trey Morgan was. 20 feet from home plate, waving off Hayden Travinsky, <laughs> making sure he didn't throw it. Yeah, they're both smiling about it a little. So Rivera to second, one away in the sixth, and Luke Heyman. <laughs> Heyman skies this one. To left, frustrated because he just missed it. And Josh Pearson for out number two. That's normally what happens to 50 degree balls. <laughs> uh, I'm still trying to figure out how he hit it 109 at 50 degree, 51 degrees. It, it is again. There's a reason it's never happened. Uh, it's pretty hard to do. <laughs> and how about him challenging that fair pole? Thank you. For a second time at his many yeah. innings. Tyler Shelnut now. Oh. What game was it when that foul pole was just getting bombarded with line drives? And it was early. Was that mm -hmm. Sunday night? Florida Oral Roberts? Put us on the spot. Sounds right. We're going to go with yes. Okay. What a pitch. Yep. Shelnut couldn't hold off. I mean, this is odd territory to be sitting here in because, again, we've had eight games that were all one run games. So, obviously, eight, the combined total of that. And then we got a nine run ball game right now here in the sixth in game two of the finals. One and two. Nine run game, and nobody had even scored nine in a game. Went early, it looked like LSU may be the team that runs away. Yeah. Rides. I mean, it was 3 1, and it was. Bang, bang, bang. But you go back and look. Even with those three runs early, they left him loaded in the first, they left him loaded in the second. Shellnut up the middle, off the glove of Thompson. Rivera to the plate. Thompson's throw does not get him. And it's a 10 run lead for the Gators here in the sixth. and gave it all he could right there. That ball just ricocheted too far for him to get to it and keep Rivera from scoring. Nice job there by Taylor Black sending Rivera all the way. Now a 10-run lead for the Gators. So with two outs, here's Ty Evans again. Oh, ball one inside. Ty Evans has four home runs in the five Florida games here in Omaha. He had four home runs in 43 games before Omaha. No player has hit five home runs in a single men's college World Series. 
Ever? Evans is one of 12 with four. JD hit, JD Drew hit three in one game. 97? 95. 95, he did it. Against USC. 2 0. Evans <laughs> takes the slider. I think that was the same year that Jeff Jenkins hit the zoo. <laughs> It was one of the prettiest home runs I have ever seen him. He hit it over the stands in right field at Rosenblatt. And we got confirmation. Nobody with five ever. Two one. Based foul, two and two. Christian Little. Is up in the LSU bullpen. 2-2. Two, two. Well, he's pitched here. Just in a different uniform. Christian Little's a 17-year-old freshman at Vanderbilt pitched on this stage and threw well. He hasn't pitched since the final weekend of the regular season. Two outs, one on here in the sixth. Two, two. Evans pops it foul. We talked about the rarity of this and the explosion of home runs for Ty Evans. He previously had one hit the last two months before coming to Omaha. Hadn't homered since April 11th. Two in this game, of course, including the Grand Slam. Two, two again. Oh. Inside and a full count. He was saving them up. Smart plan. Just, just that happen. Just conserve. <laughs> this game is so strange sometimes. He's got one hit in the last month and a half. It's four home runs in a week. His first two ABs were a double down the right field line and yeah. a homer over the bullpen. I mean, it was just a laser show from the jump. Check swing roller back to money. Flips getting over. It is 12 unanswered for the Gators who lead by 10. I'm Alex Bregman. I played in Omaha for the LSU Tigers. Now I play third base for the Houston Astros. My favorite thing about Omaha was just the, the love for the game that the fans had there. The town shuts down and all that matters is, is college baseball. LSU and Omaha definitely prepared me to play here in the big leagues. When you play in a big stage like that in front of 30,000 people, uh, the game slows down for you now, so it's a lot of fun, and uh, I really enjoyed it. A guy who wore eight before for the Fighting Tigers, Alex Bregman, who, by the way, you can watch on Sunday Night Baseball later on tonight. Florida 13, LSU 3 as we go to the bottom of the six. Nothing and one on Tommy White with two, three, and four for LSU here against Nick Ficarota. White on the ground to Colby Halter. Back in the tag, one gone. Sunday Night Baseball in L.A. It's Astros and Dodgers. And in game two, Alex Bregman had a grand slam, but Dodgers got the one-run win. There was that controversial Bach call in the eighth. Dusty Baker got ejected. 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ESPN and the ESPN app. Ravi calling that one with Eduardo and Ryan Stanek was not real happy about that ball call last night. Was it? I'd see. It. Yeah. He did not agree, I think would be the way to put it. Former Arkansas Razorback. Pitched here, didn't he? Ravi, by the way, we did get confirmation. His flight landed. <laughs> he made it out west. He's locked in watching. So a hello to Ravi from afar. 0-2 to Trey Morgan is bounced in by Ficarota. BT's not going to miss those when he's oh. managing money. No. That, that's what he's not going to miss. At first he had to block about 50 splits to start the day, <laughs> and now he gets clipped on the bare hand. He's going to be working in an ETF sales group of Franklin Templeton starting at the end of next month. He has said, I'm excited for the time that I'm going to have on my hands. 
It is a big commitment for these players. Morgan to first. Taglione recovers and flips. Brown number two. All right, so we think Caglione on one side. Thatcher Hurd for Probably. LSU if it got to yeah. that again, bottom of the sixth inning. Yeah, I, I, I would think that's where you'd start. I mean, Gidry would still be good to go. You haven't used Herring. Yeah. Griffin Herring will definitely figure in somewhere tomorrow for LSU. <laughs> Hurd, Herring, Cooper, Cooper. And maybe the big guy. We'll see. Ball and a strike to uh, Gavin Dugas. It's 123 pitches and 120 pitches in the two starts for Paul Skeens. Oh, oh. Come on. Two one. Dugas bounces it foul. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? That would be three days rest. He yep. pitched. He started on four days rest. Correct. His last time out. Correct. Yeah, it was a major, normal major yep. rest. Yeah. So, you know, he gave you. What was the pitch total last time? One twenty. He gave you one twenty on four days rest. I, I know there's now a cumulative effect with all of it, right? But it seems to stand to reason he could give you some pretty good bullets on three days rest. Oh, he absolutely can. Yeah, I, I I would be surprised if we don't see him. I think you just have to decide in what role and, and how do you use him. The rare one, two, three in the bottom of the sixth. Paul Skeens at LSU. Get ready on the radar gun. And he strikes out on 102. Fastball dotted in 99. Strike three called at 100. Yes! 123 pitches. He hit 146 times. He's got the big velocity and he's got the pitch execution as well. And a ton of strikeouts. You look at the last 25 years. Only Jared Weaver with more K's in a season than Paul Skeens. Names. Oh, shit. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good list right there. I'd say, I'd say that's an indicator of things to come. Yes. We will see if there is a game three if Paul Skeens is a part of it. And as you guys said, to what extent? One and one from Blake Money to Colby Halter. Nine one and two for Florida. Up ten in the seventh in game two of this best of three. One and two. Now elsewhere, LSU pitching wise, Thatcher Hurd looked mm -hmm. really good, and he's been a different guy down the stretch yeah. for the Tigers. He has. He, he certainly looks like he's turned the corner. Positioned himself nicely to be one of the guys moving into the rotation next year. I would I would think he's the one and staring down arguably the biggest moment of his young career. Three innings of shutout ball Thursday after he followed Paul Skeens against Wake Forest. Two and two. And then if you do have Jack Caglione on the other side, boy, that would be a ton of fun and hype and excitement for a game three winner take all for the national championship. And Caglione's last time out was. He it, found it. It was erratic. But he found effectively it. Effectively I mean, wild. It looked like it might go entirely off the rails, and it, it did. He was able to. Hang around long enough. His thing is just throwing strikes. I mean, right. If he throws strikes, he's usually not a lot of damage. Cut on and missed. And Halter strikes out for the first down in the seventh. Money kind of a short arm action. There's that elevated four seamer. We're used to seeing that. Gets it to get Halter. So a night after Florida struck out 20 times. A lot better job tonight of putting the ball in play, but not there. So one down back to the top for Cade Curlin. Freshman second baseman's been on all four times. 
you know, back to Caglione as well. He's got a home run now. And Kevin O'Sullivan said this to us a few days ago that it's really the first time that he had felt like Caglione maybe got a little sped up. The word he used was maybe just rattled a little bit. There was an RBI record, a home run record oh. that were hovering around and that Sully thought Jack Caglione might have been aware of. And he said to us, I think that's weighing on him. And they had a conversation about it earlier in the week, back on Monday at practice. Two and one. And so what would it look like for Caglione on the bump? Big pressure situation, but maybe having had a little more time in his second start here to settle in. I, I, I think the approach with Caglione has been more, let's just sit right down the middle. Just try to throw it right down the middle. And then let, let the natural stuff take over it. I think it's it just becomes a very important first inning because when he struggled the most this year, it started right away. It's a pretty good combination, folks. Two-way player award finalist. I think you can probably take the back end of that sentence off right now and just say winner, one of three finalists for the Golden Spikes. Do it again. Curlin pulls it and it drops down beside Josh Pearson. Curlin digs and doubles in the seventh. Man. Well, th there's a ton of positives the Gators can take away from what they've done in this ball game. Obviously, you had to win, right? That was it. Didn't matter one nothing or scoring a couple touchdowns. But when you get the top third of this lineup going, and specifically Caglione, because he's going to have the ball in his hand, I, I just think that one's going to be hard to equate how much better he's going to feel about himself going into that start tomorrow. Langford ropes one to the wall in left. Curlin scores and Wyatt Langford is some kind of locked in right now. It's another laser. It's, he is you so much fun to watch him. When he gets right. it going because he does not miss the barrel. Everything is barreled up. A fastball down and in. We saw last time was a 450 foot homer. This time just a lousy double. Puts a dent in the left field wall as it approaches. Wyatt Langford continues to be an exit velocity line drive ball striking machine. And Jay Johnson with a visit to Blake Money on the mound. Like the Brooks Kepka of college baseball, just a like ball that. striker. Yes, compressing. Yes. Lots of compression. Melted baseballs, a lot of them for the Gators. Christian Little next in line, the fifth LSU arm after this. Wyatt Langford helping lead the way for Florida. He's got a poor hit ball game, and then Jack Caglione went back to back with him in the sixth for the Gators. Put up five in that six. They had a six run third inning as well, prompting a fifth different Tigers pitcher. It's Christian Little. Now we talked about a little when he was warmed up. Christian Little has been on this stage his freshman year at Vanderbilt. Pitched in the College World Series, didn't really have a role last year with Vandy. Was started a little, came out of the bullpen, decides to go into the portal. 19 time has been on this year. He did make eight starts. And faces Caglione. That's his only reset. You can hear that's the only reset of the pitch clock for Christian Little on that disengagement. 32 home runs, 87 driven in for Jack Caglione. Again, we've shared this before. He told us unexpected is probably the word that first came to mind for him to describe this season. Thought he might hit 15 home runs, but he didn't anticipate, and I don't know if anyone did. A season quite like this one for the sophomore out of Tampa. This one goes off the glove of Hayden Travinsky and advances Wyatt Langford to third. But surprise, Travinsky's still in. Been battling a rib issue or a bleak issue. He had to reach for a fastball from Blake Money and, and really go up and get it. It's on the left side. It did not look like it felt good. Redshirt junior Alex Malazzo. You see, it started the last four games before this one, including last night.
<laughs> that's a strike. Jay Johnson had said to his pregame that for Travinsky, it, it happened in game two of the Super Regional against Kentucky. Jay Johnson said he didn't even remember it happening. But Milazzo had stepped in for Travinsky these last few. Chopped to first, and Trey Morgan waited on it and flips to Little for out number two as Langford scores. Frustration all over for the Fighting Tigers and their fans here in game two. Now Josh Rivera with the score 15-3. Huh. Well, we knew it was going to be offensive. I don't I don't know that 15 was on anybody's prediction list. Rolled left field base hit. Second hit of the ball game for Josh Rivera. Hit number 15 for the Gators so far today. Curlin reached base five times. Langford reached base five times. Eglay on three. Just drove in another one right there. Now Rivera on there for the third time. Guys, you talked about noticing the looseness of this Florida dugout when we were down here during batting practice, and it was almost like you could feel it coming off the bus, like Kevin O'Sullivan all smiles. And I asked him how he got the guys to this point, because when I stuck around yesterday, it was Whoa. heartbreak. I and mean, B.T. Ryfell sat there for a long time yesterday after the, and just stared at the ground. And he's like, you know what? It's actually pretty easy, because this is what baseball is. I didn't really need to have a long speech of, you know, Let's get our minds right. The guys just knew. They knew that it still starts today. Two wins, that's all we need. And Jack Caglione said this to you, Chris, when he got off the bus as well, that they did this in the regionals. They won three straight elimination games. Aiden Travinsky had the fourth LSU error just there. So Josh Rivera is now over at third. He's got a little chippier in here. Yeah, I don't think Wes Johnson or anybody in the LSU dugout appreciated the stolen base there from Josh Rivera. That was interesting. In a 12 run ball game. Wes Johnson of course the pitching coach for LSU. Soon to be Georgia head coach. 3-0 from Little, and that's a strike to B.T. Ryapel. Three one huh. is a strike at a full count. Christian Little comes home and misses. So Ryapel walks, and Rivera was running on Hayden Travinsky. Yeah, watch when he has to go get it. It's that one where he has to extend it. It just rips that lane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. There he was after the throw on Rivera. And you're right, KP. It's surprising that he's still out there at this point. Part of the reason that he was in there, Berkey, you said it earlier, was more offensive day, wind blowing out. You'd love to get that bat in the lineup over the defensive-minded Alex Malazzo. But Jay Johnson also said to us in the dugout that Nate Ackenhausen, who, of course, was the starter for LSU in this game, one of the easier guys on our staff to catch. So they felt like maybe less wear and tear <laughs> receiving Nate Ackenhausen, who, of course, now been out of the game for a while. Well, it's interesting. We haven't seen Travinsky make any winces when he's hitting right but he definitely looks uncomfortable back there behind the dish right now two on two out one out of Luke Heyman is last foul Heyman reached on the fielder's choice and error back in the third score to run that inning 
in the six-run frame. Get out Blocked the way, by get Travinsky, away. who recovers. Rivera holds it third. Ryan Pell advances to second. A classic last night in game one. What? It's been one sided here in game two. 2 1. Heyman cuts through it. That six spot in the third just. Just blew it all open and what might have been right there was. Some things that could have gone differently in that inning for LSU defensively but Florida. Capitalized. Well. It was the 51 degree launch angle home run. Change the whole inning. I mean, any other day at this ballpark, that's caught, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Three two to Heyman, and he strikes out. Inning over. Florida leads by a dozen, trying to force a game three that would be tomorrow night. 15 runs for Florida here in game two, trying to force this. We're getting closer to removing that parenthetical. It would be a game three tomorrow night right here on ESPN at 7 o'clock Eastern time, 6 local for the national championship. Gorgeous Sunday evening now in Omaha, Nebraska with Chris Budden, Kyle Peterson, and Chris Burke. Mike Monica with you. This game produced by Scott Gustafson and directed by Scott Johnson. Bottom of the seventh, Nick Ficarota back to work. Cade Beloso <laughs> takes strike one. Beloso has walked three times in this game. <laughs> so 15 runs. Florida has played in 50 games now total at the Men's College World Series. The 15 runs match the most they've ever scored here in Omaha. Okay. Put up 15 on Miami. Back in 2015. It's the third time LSU has allowed 15 in a game here at the World Series. Played in a game once in Rosenblatt where our starting pitcher got the win and gave up 11 earnings. So, really? Yeah. <laughs> we, beat, we beat Georgia 19 to 12, and I believe Patrick Hicklin got the win. I think he threw five or six with 11 earned runs. Someone have to fact check me on that, but that's the way I remember it. Veloso pops this one up. Short left center. And Tyler Shelnut's there for the first down. So a win with 11 earned runs, is that more or less improbable than being traded in big league baseball for yourself? Well, those, those, they're both very small percentages. We also had a guy in that game, Chris Bennett, go six for six. I, I believe that's still a record. Wow. KB, if you're listening, way to go. We got beat 21-13 also that year. It was a little offensive, that yeah. series. <laughs> and Travinsky grounds it at Colby Halter. Picked by Caglione, two guns. But just just to clarify Mr. Monaco's statement you were in fact <laughs> traded for yourself at one point. This is true. I, I was traded from the Padres to the Mariners for a player to be named later. A couple of weeks later I was the player to be named later. <laughs> Back to the Padres. Back to the Padres for myself. <laughs> This is what we talked about during brunch <laughs> before the game. Great Joe Bear takes ball one. And for as long as you've known KP, KP had never heard that before. No, I felt like I'd heard them all. And I, <laughs> yeah, you dropped two of two of them on me today. I'd never heard. I'm a deep well, KP. And the other one was really good too. You hit a home run to lead off an inning. Team batted around and then you got pinch hit for it. That's right. That's when I knew it was time to go to the booth. <laughs> <laughs> Got traded for myself and got pinch hit for in the same inning. I hit a homer, and it was not too long after I put my cleats away. One, two. This one hits Braden Joe Bear. He's on for the second time. 
And a two out base runner for LSU in the last of the seventh. We've had a lot of oddities at this year's College World Series. We had an inside the park home run. We had all sorts of comebacks. Flares for the dramatic from the first game of this thing. Oral Roberts and TCU got it started two Fridays ago. Now Jordan Thompson. The, the 51 degree launch angle homer just adds to our list of oddities. I can tell this one is is really close to your heart. I mean, I just can't get over it. Again, that was two home runs for Ty Evans right toward the pole. And you saw the reaction earlier from Nate Ackenhausen, like disbelief that those got out. I wish we could get a simulator and see where that ball would have landed like three days ago. Because yesterday it was kind of blown out to left, but like. I bet it would have gone like. 200 feet. <laughs> like Halter might have, or excuse me, Tommy White may have had a play on it. Thompson strikes out, and the inning is over. Player to be named later, folks, two weeks later. <laughs> now for today's Capital One rewarding performance. How about Ty Evans? This was a little more standard, even though he wasn't quite sure when he left the bat. That was just a rocket right past the foul pole. Now this one soars above the foul pole. A 51 degree launch homer. Ty Evans setting records, grand slam, most tied for the most home runs in College World Series history, having himself one heck of a week here in Omaha. And how about the dominance of Florida in this game, leading by a dozen into the eighth when their backs were against the wall. Headlined by Ty Evans and this entire lineup. Well, okay. And they picked up a starting pitcher in Hurston Waldrop, who had been so good throughout this postseason for him, but today only went two and a third. Now the bullpen has been great, and the bats been thorough. Well. Christian Little working here against Tyler Shelma. Four. Four pitch walk Tyler Shelnut is on a couple of changes freshman Jared Jones has come in behind the plate for Hayden Travinsky who does exit the game and Ben Napolt takes over at short for Jordan Thompson. Here's Ty Evans, a strikeout and a ground out since the Grand Slam. Fouls one off of Jones. Okay. Welcome to the game, mm -hmm. Mr. Jones. <laughs> so he spent most of his time this year at first base, some in the DH role, but a lot of his prep career behind the plate. Cut and a miss, nothing in two. Kevin O'Sullivan said to Chris Button that he had seen better BP from Ty Evans. Now four home runs here in Omaha. Chops it foul. I think he's probably going to play again tomorrow. <laughs> ah, huh. What a run for Ty Evans. Guy got drafted by the Braves out of high school in the 20th round. 0-2. Oh, oh. Misses. Kevin O'Sullivan's been proud of him. He said the other day that Evans has just hung in there and battled. Obviously disappointed with the playing time drying up. Lines this one toward right center field and a base hit. Shelma took a big turn and gets back to the bag. First two on for the Gators here in the eighth inning. I'd like to see that after wrapping two around a pole earlier, using the 
middle of the field that time for Evans. He had struck out, grounded back to the pitcher. Now stays on one and serves it out to center. So two out there with nobody gone for Colby Halter. Doubled back in the sixth, came around to score one of the five runs that inning for the Gators. That's down to start out from Christian Little. How about 14 unanswered? Two and up. White Lankford, a couple hitters away. Triple shy of the cycle in this one. A couple singles, a homer, and a double. Going to get an opportunity to put his name in the record books. He's got a four hit, four RBI game. He's only the second guy to do that here at the College World Series since it moved to this ballpark in 2011. Dominic Fletcher did it for Arkansas in 2018. It's been a monster game for Langford. Alter takes a strike. We ended up having a near cycle for Braden Jobert early on in mm -hmm. this tournament. In the air toward left center. Dylan Cruz coast to the gap for the first out. Yeah, Brayton Jobert hit a double, triple, and a homer, and his his out was a bullet off of Andrew Lindsay that was going to be a clean single up the middle. A little misfortune there, but huge game one for Braden Jobert for the Tigers. Langford one spot behind this guy, Cade Curlin. He's had a great day as well. Infield single, hit by a couple of pitches, a walk and a double his last time, and a hard hit comebacker. This one off of Little, who recovers, and then Morgan stayed on the bag for out number two. Trey Morgan just <laughs> continues to stay save outs. This ball is smoked right back off the foot of Christian Little. Foot and then the glove, and then this one's where it got uncomfortable. And so there's two in scoring position for Wyatt Langford. Three run homer and a run scoring double his last two times. And Berkey, just walk us through what you see when he steps in the box. Well, I, again, we talked, we said simple, stable is, you know, just words that I would use to define the way he sets up. It's it's pretty vertical with his initial posture. His hands are a little lower than normal, but then he really gets into his legs, right? And the, the juice that he can create is because of the way he gets into his legs. He does a nice job of separating, even though he starts from a kind of a low hand position. Those, that upper body coils as that leg kick gets into the ground and from there I mean he's such a strong dude he doesn't have to manufacture a lot with his load ropes another one in the left and oh, here's it. Here he, is. Get it. he needs a triple for the cycle and will stop at second on another bullet What do you think, KP? Should he should he put the gas pedal down here? He was going to be out, gonna be out by about 30. <laughs> Pearson dives, and when he dives, you think maybe there's a chance. Right. He laid out for it, but did a good job of getting back to his feet. Well, that one that one felt like it. You're right, though. He really did a nice job of hustling to recover that ball. And a massive day continues for Wyatt Langford. Five for five with six ribbies. Two doubles, a home run, and a walk. Now Jack Caglione on an 0-1. And Caglione pulls this one to right and to the track. And Joe Bear looks up, and it's gone! Caglione second. And it is a Gator onslaught in game two.
That's wait, a lot, Jango. What do we got? Wait a second. 114 miles an hour, and we are being told 56 degree launch angle. We we thought 51 was interesting. What, what about 56 kp? What, what, what are we supposed to say about? What's that? crazy is how different this place plays on a given day. I mean, I, two things that we've never seen happen happened in the exact same day. And yet any other day that we're here, they're both nonchalant outs. He hits some just about. When they're not, I mean, the power is so easy for Jack Caglione. 56 degrees. I mean, at that exit velocity as well. Nice play up the middle there by Ben Napoltz. Ends another four-run inning. Jack Caglione to the clouds. 19 for the Gators. Mm. How about it? Jack Caglione, and there you have it. Chris Burke, uh, the distance a little farther than that <laughs> for Cags. How about the look post-contact? Straight to the sky. Like, uh. it, it went off of our radar, so we couldn't track the distance. He looks straight to the sky. And that ball just never came down. I mean, Joe Bear was Joe Bear thought he was underneath it like three different times. How good has this been from Florida? Josh Pearson pops this one up to begin the bottom of the eighth, and Cade Curlin calls off Jack Canglione. I mean, we're talking about 19 runs from the Gators needing to win to continue their season. They had come into yesterday on an eight-game winning streak, had had the elimination game wins in the regionals, stormed through the Supers in some tight ones against South Carolina. Three one-run wins here. And remember, the number two overall seed. Remember the way this started, too. I mean, Florida got the first two guys on, then Keg Leon grounded out. They went strikeout Rivera, strikeout Riopelle, and you're going, ooh. This may be what we saw yesterday, but the Ty Evans solo home run just opened the gates. Oh. Well, you, you saved Slater, right? Fisher and Neely. I don't, I, maybe they were available. I doubt it, but you didn't have to worry about it. You, you got your, your superstars red hot, feeling good. You got your guy who's going to pitch tomorrow a two-homer day. I mean, it, you couldn't really draw it up better, even though Waldrop wasn't his usual self today. The Gators, boy, they, they had one for the memory yeah. today. I mean, it just is as special as it gets offensively. Paxton Kling is the pinch hitter, and it's two and two. I think if you're Jay Johnson after this one, it's like, listen, just go have dinner. It, it still only counts for one. Mm -hmm. I mean, this this is why yesterday was so special, and then it's show up tomorrow. Both sides with a chance to win the whole thing. Kling reaches off of Cade Curlin's glove. Hey, for more coverage of the NCAA Men's College World Series and interactive brackets, go to NCAA.com, your official online home for all 90. NCAA championships. I'm with you, KP. I mean, w when you're playing for a national championship, I think you'd much rather lose a laugher yeah. than lose a heartbreaker. Reset, show up tomorrow. We still got the ability to do what we wanted to do when we showed up. First day of fall ball. One to win it all. Jack Merrifield is the pinch hitter here for LSU. And he goes first pitch swinging on a line to left at Tyler Shelna for the second out. Flip side for Florida. Chris Budden's been talking about how loose the Gators were. We saw that a little bit down mm -hmm. in the dugout pregame. How do you bottle this and just continue what you found in this game and, and specifically the top of the line? Well, I mean, you're going to keep the good vibes going, right? There, that's. That's not going to change, but the, the person who can change it is Thatcher Hurd. And Thatcher Hurd's been fantastic. So, it, you know, just because you're feeling great going into one game, if the other pitcher goes out there and executes the way he's capable of, huh. he can he can change the vibes in a dugout quickly. 19-3. Ethan Fry, the next in line of the pinch hitters. Oh. Ball in a strike. On the ground, foul one and two. 
Gators have had answers when they've been backed into corners here in the NCAA tournament. Wyatt Langford and company showing that again here today. Chopper to third and Halter puts it in his pocket off the short hop. Ethan Fry is on. Tough chance there from Colby Halter. He's been playing really, really deep because of how fast and firm this surface is playing right now. That was a do or die charge right there, just kind of clanked off the heel. And now this one rolled foul by Gavin Dugas. Figueroa's 01. And that is rolled at Halter. Went for the tag, throws the first, and got the tag at first on Paxton Kling. So the eighth is over. We go to the ninth, and Florida is cruising toward a game three at Omaha. What a great day of baseball we've had here on ESPN throughout the day. It started overseas in London. We had a Golden Spikes Award winner get announced. Game two of this Men's College World Series final and capped off with the Astros and the Dodgers. Sam Dutton is next in line. The sophomore right-hander from Alabama takes over for LSU. You talk about this plenty throughout. I mean, I, I think biggest advantage that you look at right now if you're LSU is your, your bullpen guys, your main bullpen guys should be ready to go tomorrow. And that's ready to go. I think ready to get extended if you need to. And the Gators probably say the exact same thing. Yeah, I think both teams are here because they have ton of confidence in the pieces that got them here. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you get to 1-1. It's 1-1 with a, with a title on the line. And both of them probably love their spot. The right? first question, I would assume, that Jay Johnson will have to answer here in about 15 or 20 minutes mm -hmm. if everything holds, is, is schemes available tomorrow? What do you guys think? I'm interested to hear his answer. Yes. Um, I think he is. Yeah. And you guys both think it would be bullpen and not starting? I do. Um, can I hold back on that until he answers it like in 25 minutes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> it, it, it feels like it's probably that. We got so many stars here in this finals. And to the ninth, <laughs> BT Ryan Pell takes strike one. I think the other thought would be he hasn't had a relief appearance all year. Obviously, there's so much in front of him from a professional standpoint that Maybe you get to the decision-making process that if we're going to use him, we're going to let him go through his normal routine, start the game, and maybe it's a... Like an opener situation? Yeah, 45, 60 pitch count kind of thing. And then on the Florida side, talked about Jack Caglione, Kate Fisher, Brandon Neely, they got Ryan Slater hot in this game, but didn't have to go to him. Right. Be good there. I mean, think about those Abner. four arms. Oh, Ryan Bell strikes this one well. Center field. Kling looks up, and it's 20 for Florida. Their sixth home run of the ball game. Six homers in, in one College World Series game, and Ryapel knew it to dead central. A no doubter, and on a day like today, you get one like that, you can get into your slow stroll. What a bomb! by B.T. Rival, 435 feet.
He did the whole single thing and now he's back to the home run. Fight. He's over there. Tucker Talbot is the pinch hitter. Richard Sophomore comes on in the DH spot for Luke Heyman. What a showing by the Gators. This was loud. I thought there might be a Rosenblatt kind of score today, but I didn't see it. And you guys said it doesn't matter how you get there. Right. You get to game three. It doesn't matter for Florida what happened in game one on Saturday. Come back today with a blitzing, and it's on to Monday night. 2-1. Misses. Great one. Yeah, emotionally, like LSU, they, they were able to check out a couple innings ago as they started seven players and this thing got really lopsided. Which is a big part of the battle, right, on the bounce back thing. It's just mentally being able to get past it. These guys are they're already past it. Talbot strikes out, and there's one gone for Dutton here in the ninth. So just think about what's at stake tomorrow night. Winner take all for a national championship. Florida looking for its second. LSU looking for its seventh. And this is a finals that started with all three Golden Spikes Award finalists. The projected top three picks in the MLB draft as well. And it's going to be one game for everything. We get one more day of it. Yeah, we're the winners. College baseball gets a prime time game three. Swing and a miss from Tyler Shell, not one and one. Florida's the seventh team to score 20 plus runs in a college World Series game. The record is 23, and that's been done twice. You got to go back to 2001 to find the last time a team put up 20 in a game here. Yeah, I, I know. Yep, Thank sorry. You. Thank you, Mike. Against you guys. At 21-13. We hung in there. You did? We a couple touchdowns ourselves, missed an extra point, but we were we hung around. Those guys have been stars, Evans and Langford. Shell up to center. And another knock for Florida. 20 hits in the ball game for the Gators. Yeah, and with BT's home run, everybody in the starting lineup in Florida scored. Curling four times, Langford four times. Another pinch hitter on for Florida here, Matt Prevesk. Fouled off on the first pitch. Matt Prevesk, a Florida native, started a few games last year. And comes out here in the spot of Ty Evans. Down from Dutton. It's very rare in a College World Series game that these coaches get to allow players yeah. opportunities to have their moment. This is this is pretty cool. Some of these guys getting a chance to say they had an A B in the College World Series. And Prevax pulls it in the right field, and he's got a hit in Omaha, and then this one gets past the right fielder, Ethan Fry. That's the way it's gone on both sides here in this one. Twenty one hits and twenty one runs for Florida.
that's now five LSU errors today, too. Turn the page. Yeah, they had and three. They, they had three the entire College World Series coming into today. They've been really good defensively. One to forget today. Oh! Colby Halter's got a double in this one. Part of that well-balanced effort up and down the entire lineup. Only twice has the team scored more runs in a men's college World Series game than what Florida has done with 21 in this one. Arizona State with 23 in 1984. And Notre Dame with 23 runs on Northern Colorado in 1957. Just had to get Notre Dame in there, didn't you? <laughs> One one, and oh. that's down to Halter. Yeah, but did they have two fifty-plus degree launch angle homers in those games? Highly okay. unlikely. Highly unlikely. I'm certain of that. It's been a wild one, and all Gators on the screws to center, and it drops down. Twenty-two to three is the Florida lead. Nobody had more, scored more than seven runs in a game. <laughs> this is an outlier on a lot of different levels today. And now Dale Thomas will pinch it for Florida. Here with the margin at 19. Again, it's 21 unanswered as well. When do you ever say that? See it when Joe Burrow was playing quarterback for the, for the Tigers or Tebow for the Gators. <laughs> That's when you say it. Sam Dunn working here in the ninth. And is 1 0 to Dale Thomas, the Coastal Carolina transfer. Dutton deals, and it's a four-pitch walk to Dale Thomas. Scorebooks are messy today, boys. Yeah, there's a lot of ink. We'll get another pinch hitter here, and it's Michael Robertson who hits for Wyatt Langford. And when the story is told of this Florida team years from now, Michael Robertson will have a special place in the tail for the Gators. And the catch that he made against TCU to end the ball game Wednesday with Braden Taylor, the superstar for the Horn Frogs at the plate. And Robertson ran back, crashed into the wall, and hung on to it to punch a ticket for Florida into the finals. How far would that ball have gone today? Yeah, there wouldn't be any catch in that one. That would have been... 30, 40 feet over the 408. Hold on just one second. <laughs> just one second. Yeah, Braden Taylor hit a ball 110 miles an hour that Trackman said went 411. And zero balls at those metrics this year in the big leagues have been out. Zero. But Michael Robertson made that play. Huh. Put that on our list of anomalies from this week. We've seen it all. Robertson said afterward, if it's in the air and it's going to be close to the wall, I'm running through it. He said it traveled further than I initially thought it was going to. And said, in the moment, I kind of almost blacked out. But it looked all right on camera. 
Richard freshman from Venice Florida. A starter for most of the season for the Gators. Two and two. And pretty cool that he plays a big role even though at one point he was in an 0 for 30 and that he's still able to after losing his starting job find a way to help out a ball club. Yeah. I'll tell you something the Gators get the lead late tomorrow. He's going to be in center field. Oh. Full count. You can run like that and defend like that. You, you can help a ball club. Finally, Sully decided that the bat just wasn't working well enough to stay out there to start the game, but he certainly helps them being able to shore up that defense at the end of games. Robertson pulls it foul. Three, two, bounced in, and it kicks away on ball four. So Robertson walks, and the Gators have him loaded with one out in the ninth inning. And of course, from the LSU side, you, you want to protect any arm that you oh, yeah, might yeah. use tomorrow in a winner take all for the College World Series. Get another pinch hitter here. And it's Derek Fabian. Came off the bench last night as well in game one. Brother Judd, of course, former star for Florida, ended up being a second round pick of the Orioles. Huh. Strike one to Derek Fabian. Fabian started a ton of games last year for him, too. Hasn't quite as much this year. Sophomore from Ocala. Lines this one to left center field, and it's a base hit. And Florida's got 24 runs in this game. The most ever in a College World Series game. And why not at this point? A uh, hang and break a ball that they actually, that was not bad. A decent pitch, baby. Go down and get it. Get your legs and. Drives in the two runs that makes history for the Gators. The 23 hits are tied for the most in a game here as well at the College World Series. seen it all here in Omaha over the last nine or ten days. What else might we yeah, have in store tomorrow? We've seen a lot. Yeah. I don't think we've seen it all. I feel like there's new frontiers. Again, that is going to be special tomorrow night. Game three, seven o'clock Eastern time, six o'clock Central. You can watch it right here on ESPN. Two of the top five seeds in the country coming into this thing. Rivera strikes out. Two gone. Whose pitching situation would you guys rather be in tomorrow? Caglione, Neely, Slater, Fisher, or Hurd? Cooper. Are you including Skeens? The possibility of Paul Skeens. I, I think it's a push, and I know that's not a great answer to your question, but I don't I don't know that there's starkly an advantage one way or the other, which should set up for a good one. Uh, yeah, I, I I think if Skeens has two, three innings in him, then I would lean advantage LSU. B.T. Rockwell takes a strike. Florida will have the momentum headed into game three. Over two. And you go 
I said earlier for LSU, the plan just flush it immediately. Yeah, I mean, it, other than those that are still on the field, like it's, it's, it's been already flushed. been flushed. Yeah. Rappel strikes out, and the inning is over. Five spot in the ninth for Florida on a historic day. Mookie Betts and the Dodgers host the Astros coming up on Sunday Night Baseball at the top of the hour right here on ESPN. It's from around Omaha, where we will play baseball for another day tomorrow night with a winner-take-all game three as Florida has scored a record-setting 24 runs in game two and 23 unanswered against LSU. He took game one in extra innings yesterday. Kate Beloso grounds out, and that's how Nick Ficarota starts the bottom of the ninth. Ficarota, for his part, has now been out there for four and a third of shutout ball. Hasn't walked anyone and has only given up two hits. All those names you were reading, guys in that Florida bullpen available tomorrow in large part because of that. Mm -hmm. You needed somebody, if you're, if you're Florida, to be lined up the best. You needed somebody today to go out and get you 9 to 12 outside of the bullpen. Figueroa's mm -hmm. been that guy. And how about Blake Purnell coming in and getting the double yes. play of Tommy White, right? That game was still very much in the balance at that point in time. 2-0 on Jared Jones. This guy can hit it to the moon, too. I mean, Jared Jones is a name that you're going to hear a lot about the next two years. Freshman from Marietta, Georgia, listed at six foot four, 230 pounds. With 14 home runs this season, freshman All-American. Facing Ficarota is at 68 pitches. And he has been massive. Cut and a miss, two and two. Picarota arrived as a walk-on at Florida. Eventually, he's going to be going to physical therapy school. Right fourth-year player and arm for the Gators. On the ground towards second. And Dale Thomas throws out Jones. Brings up Braden Joe Bear with two outs in the bottom of the ninth. And Ficarota trying to finish this for Florida. Joe Bear walk in was hit by a pitch his last time in the seventh. Joe Bear, center field. To the track and got him. Braden Joe Bear to straightaway center field. And LSU. Gets a solo shot here in the ninth. And the Tiger fans that are left are still excited. Yeah. That one, we are just not used to seeing the ball just ease out to dead center field, KP. Mm. We got something positive on that Tiger side to end with. Joe Bear stays on one. Yeah, that just kept going. That, that, that he looked like a routine fly ball was going to end it. Traveled about two feet beyond that outfield fence. Now Ben DePolt. <laughs> Corner. LSU took a one nothing lead in the first. Florida tied it up in the second on a Ty Evans home run. Oh. LSU got two in the bottom of the second, and then it was all Florida until that swing in a massive way. Chopper right side. That's foul. Baby, and then it's foul. Ficarota's one two is up high, two and two on the Pulse. Chopper 
a foul. Ficarota one strike away, and it's on the ground off of Ficarota. Caroms to Fabian, he grips. Ficarota's fired up, and Florida fights on to a game three against LSU tomorrow night. That was a heck of a play, by the way, to end that thing. <laughs> but off the bat, this thing's humming, and Ficarota wears it off the spike and then goes dead sprint over. Fabian hits him in stride. Mike Foot just gets down there. The big boy went five complete today to lock it up. 24 runs for the Gators. Kristen. Well, I don't I don't even know what to say about that offensive performance, but the, the Gator bullpen was fantastic and Caglione and Langford put on a show today that has to get this Gator offense going. One of the most talented groups in America put on a show for us today. The last two teams standing in college baseball will play one game tomorrow night at 7 o'clock Eastern for everything to close it down in the men's college world series. Coming up next, it's baseball tonight, Sunday night countdown anchored by Kevin Connors. For Chris Budden, Kyle Peterson, Chris Burke, and our entire crew behind the scenes, Mike Monaco saying so long now to KC with baseball tonight.